Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to TIFF by Lightbox. My name is Keith Benny, and I work in our adult learning department. It's our pleasure you to, uh, to welcome you to our first higher learning event of our winter season, aptly named First Things First, Coming of Age in Canadian Film, uh, of course, as part of the Canada's Top 10 Film Festival. Uh, before I introduce you to our moderator, who will then introduce you to our panelist, uh, I'd like to mention a few thank yous. So on behalf of TIFF, we'd like to thank our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris, and Visa, as well as our major public supporters, the government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, and the City of Toronto. We'd also like to thank our Canada's Top 10 Film Festival supporting partners, the Directors Guild of Canada, and our media partner, Now Magazine. Uh, as a charitable organization, we'd also like to thank our donors and members for making TIFF's year-round programming, educational, and community outreach initiatives possible. Um, a few reminders, we ask that you please place your phones on silent. Taking uh, photos or video recording is not allowed at any point during the event, but we do encourage you to tweet uh, using the TIFF hashtag SeeTheNorth. Uh, we'd also like to welcome our online audience tuning in via the YouTube live stream. Uh, during the Q&A, we do ask that you wait for a uh, microphone to reach you before asking a question of our illuminated panelists. Um, I would like to invite you to two of our upcoming higher learning events uh, throughout our winter season. On January 29th, uh, following a shorts program of their work, emerging and established filmmakers discuss the role of film in exploring issues of spirituality, faith, tolerance, and cultural identity. On March 11th, we welcome curators from the Museum of the Moving Image, as well as the Harry Ransom Center and TIFF, to discuss the management of an exhibition of film ephemera. Uh, more details about upcoming events can be found online at tiff.net slash higher learning, where as a student and, for, and or faculty member, we encourage you to sign up for our e-newsletters. Um, two final notices today. There are really great opportunities taking place in the building that we'd like to draw your attention to, and they're both free. Uh, we'd like to thank our colleagues in the industry office for providing us an opportunity uh, to experience the new Samsung Gear VR sets as part of the Samsung VR Lounge. Um, this is a free interactive activation. The lounge is located upstairs on the third floor and is activating today from 12 p.m. noon to 3.30. We hope you have a chance to check out this exciting new technology. And secondly, uh, we'd like to remind all of you of uh, the free screening that this afternoon at 3 p.m. It's our Canadian Open Vault, where we'll be screening My American Cousin, directed by Sandy Wilson, who's a panelist on today's panel. Um, tickets to the event are free and available from our box office downstairs. So after the panel, go upstairs, check out the VR, um, cancel all your plans, and come for the 3 p.m. screening. Um, Okay, so we are thrilled to have Jason Anderson as the moderator for today's event. Jason writes about film and arts for such publications as the Toronto Star, Cinemascope, Sight and Sound, and Uncut, and teaches criticism and feature writing at the University of Toronto and Ryerson University. He's a director of programming for the Kingston Canadian Film Festival, a member of the Toronto Film Critics Association, and is a TIFF shortcut, Shortcuts programmer. Um, please uh, join me in thanking Jason for moderating today. Great. Thanks so much, Keith. And I have the uh, great pleasure and honor of uh, introducing our panelists uh, for tonight's, uh, today's panel, which is titled First Things First, which we will get into the many ramifications of that title uh, very shortly. Uh, starting at my uh, furthest right, Sandy Wilson was born in Penticton, British Columbia. She was written and directed the features My American Cousin, which premiered at the festival and won six Genie Awards, including Best Picture, Best Director, and Best Original Screenplay, as well as its sequel, American Boyfriends. She has also directed the feature Harmony Cats and the shorts Bridal, uh, The Bridal Shower, Growing Up in Paradise, and My Life in Eight Minutes. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, next to her, Andrew Cividino. Uh, he grew up in Dundas, Ontario, and attended the film production program at Ryerson University. His short film, We Ate the Children Last, was selected as TIFF as one of Canada's top 10 shorts of 2011. Uh, Sleeping Giant, based on his 2014 Top 10 short of the same name, is his first feature, and it's screening uh, this week as part of Canada's Top 10. Welcome, Andrew. Also have Kyle McDonald. Uh, Kyle grew up on a sheep farm outside Goderich, Ontario. He discovered film at an early age and pursued it through high school and into his post-secondary career, first at Concordia University and then at Ryerson, where he graduated in 2015 with a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Film Studies and his short film, Manessa Tung, uh, is, is here as part of the uh, top 10 for student, student shorts. <laughs> also, uh, Halima al Katabi is a Montreal-based filmmaker. She graduated from l'Institut National de Limanche et du Son. She scripted the short La Paracade, and Nina is her directorial debut, and it's here as part of uh, Canada's top 10 shorts this year. 
and also uh, Neve Fishman, who is here as the uh, producer of many, many films that have been here uh, at TIFF in ta Canada's Top Ten, uh, and he's here also uh, representing as executive producer Closet Monster, which is here at Canada's Top Ten. So thanks, Neve. And, uh, and yeah, it was, I mean, I think it's a great subject, I and mean, certainly one, you know, the coming of age story is certainly something that uh, uh, I feel uh, very, you know, it's kind of one thing that's sort of, I think, a core part of any kind of film fan's diet, and certainly um, we can all think of films that, um, that touched us or inspired us or influenced in some way, these sorts of stories, and, and maybe they're things you encounter when you're young, maybe they're things you encounter when you're uh, much older and sort of looking back on this time of, of sort of childhood and adolescence and all these immense changes that you go through, um, all these big big things that happen. And that's certainly something that I think uh, uh, filmmakers return to again and again. I mean, one thing I was thinking about was how um, childhood and adolescence seems to take about a million times longer than the rest of your life. <laughs> once you hit, once you hit the sort of back end of things, things go a lot faster. Whereas, you know, I think child and adolescence seem to take uh, occupy about sort of uh, you know several millennia. Uh, so I think there's a lot to excavate. And I think that's sort of one reason that we kind of see filmmakers uh, come back to this territory again and again. And certainly, you have this sort of you know kind of rich history, really from the beginnings of, of movies. I mean, certainly, um, you know, going back to all kinds of things that have uh, that have really kind of become staples of this genre. Uh, I think about films like Stand By Me or or The 400 Blows or, or My Life as a Dog. I mean, there's just any number of things that I think that have kind of made that kind of impact and, and, and fostered something with audiences. And certainly Canada, I think, is a really uh, great tradition of this. And certainly it's interesting to see how many of the films that we sort of most treasure uh, kind of fit in this category, too. I mean, certainly look at something like Mon Oncle Antoine or Nobody Waved Goodbye, uh, maybe more recent examples like Crazy. Um, I also like to think that Ginger Snaps counts, even though it's a coming of age story with more hair uh, and more blood. Uh, but certainly these are, these are films that make an impact and certainly some things that we, we certainly treasure. And I guess I was just gonna, gonna start with the panelists and, and, uh, and ask them, first of all, sort of what, what kinds of coming of age films have, have made an impact on them and perhaps influenced uh, the, story they, the stories they're, they're bringing here. Sure, Sandy, Should thank I you. just jump right in? Please do. Okay. Um, well, I grew up on a ranch at the end of the dirt road, and uh, we didn't have a telephone or a television, but my dad took home movies. And uh, he would bring home National Film Board films, and we'd look at the home movies, uh, which I always totally enjoyed. It was wonderful to see yourself on the screen. And um, the films that I liked uh, were like um, The Last Picture Show, American Graffiti, Mon Oncle Antoine. Uh, and I think that those childhood years are the years which stain us most deeply. So it is rich territory. Yeah, for me, I think, uh, I mean, I did a lot of research while working on my, my script in, in the genre and watching a lot. And the films that really stuck with me, I think in more recent years, were films like Andrea Arnold's Fish Tank. Um, uh, Tomboy was an incredible film recently. And then also there are ones that you go to for different reasons. So for me, in terms of uh, setting and tone, uh, Picnic at Hanging Rock is, is kind of, you know, it's a more obscure Australian film, but it's got this incredible sense of uh, foreboding in the setting that really mirrors the, the, this, the darkness of this coming of age tale. So I think you go to different places for different pieces of inspiration throughout, and there's definitely no shortage in this genre. Uh, yeah, growing up, I feel like I tended towards fantasy, even as a like a coming of age story. So even if you look at the original Star Wars, and I also was growing up at the pinnacle of like Harry Potter, which progressed growing up through many films. And then yeah, in researching my film, I looked at very typical coming of age stories, like st you mentioned, Stand by Me, uh, Mud, Kings of Summer, like a lot of recent stuff as well as older stuff. Thank you. <coughs> Well, uh, I was also influenced by um, Andre Arnold's films, like Fish Tank and uh, Celine Sciamma, and some uh, older uh, films uh, from um, Maurice Piala in France. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, you know, the um, Darden Brothers film, um, and um, very contemporary movies uh, dealing with uh, teenage uh, coming of age stories. So, and Mainly French French films, actually. <laughs> I have my own, I think. Hello, hello. You're good. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, well, actually, when I first started making films, one of the first films uh, that I worked on was a short film that was uh, about my partner's grandfather in BC, and I became aware of uh, Sandy's work and, and, and your use of, of, of home movies, um, I think, influenced uh, probably the way that I've been thinking about making movies forever, and a lot of our movies in the past 40 years uh, have had the use of home movies, or sometimes made fake home movies, because we're just so enamored with that form. And then, of course, uh, your film, uh, My American Cousin, was such a seminal film that uh, made me realize that uh, you know we can make great movies in this country, and, and uh, so thank you for that. Uh, I, I guess earlier than that, you know, I'm a Court is one of my favorite films. It was really, really amazing and uh, and I was just doing some research uh, <laughs> before it, uh, one of my truly favorite films I thought was just so beautiful and I wish would never end was uh, uh, was uh, uh, l'argent de poche a small change I think it was called a Truffaut film that I thought when I was thinking about it just in the green room before I thought well where did I see that and I thought uh, I remember seeing it at the Cinesphere uh, and it was the first year of TIFF so that's how old I am uh, 1976, uh, it was a gala <laughs> in the first year, uh, and uh, um, it was kind of interesting to connect it to this and to TIFF and to all of these things that have happened since then. Well, it's amazing, because certainly, I mean, you know, as, as a programmer and a critic, of, it, it, it's something that always seems to be kind of part of, of, of the sort of movie menu, these sorts of films, and, and you know... Um, uh, you know, good and less good. Of course, all the ones here are great. But it's sort of, I, I guess one thing I was curious about from news perspective is, is this a kind of film that the industry uh, wants more of? Or is it something that kind of, it's, what's, what's the sort of uh, perception of the sort of coming of age film from that sort of perspective? Well, I think, I think um, you know, we love those kind of films and I think any person in the audience would, would point to a coming of age film as, you know, or several of them as their favorite films ever. Uh, I think from the perspective of trying to make them or being a producer of, you know, I think the, wor the, the moment you pitch someone, you, you can't even say the words coming of age together because once you do, like, you just, you know, your, your, your funder or your distributor just falls to the ground, like, uh, just impossible, really. You know, I think these guys have made their films just on their own. <laughs> like, uh, I'm sure, Andrew, you probably had a similar experience and then you had to make your film and then after... You know, people supported it, but I think that that uh, uh, it, it, you know it's 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 a kind of it, it's a kind of genre that that uh, uh, just does not have uh, 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 sort of a, a, an initial backing from people. Um, I mean, I can say uh, you know tell you a funny story about when we first uh, pitched Closet Monster uh, to our esteemed distributor. I don't know if anyone is here from Elevation. <laughs> Good. I'm sure they're watching in the office right now. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, we, we kind of had to, you know, we said, well, you know, it's a film. It's from a really brilliant, you know, filmmaker who's done a lot of shorts of Stephen Dunn, you know, and he's going to be really, it's, you know, he's really going to be acclaimed at one point, but he's a first-time filmmaker and they kind of slump a bit. And you say, well, you know, it's a it's a coming of age story, it's just, you know, like just like, you know, and then and then you say, well, you know, it's set in St. John's, Newfoundland, and it's you know, gay, <laughs> and it's like, ah. you know, so um, and they said, absolutely not, you know, no way, and we said, yes, you have to do it, and and you know, they ended up doing it, and then I have to say, you know, uh, if they are watching, uh, is that the moment they saw the film, which is exactly my point here, is that you know, a very rough cut of the film the room just lit up and they said, wow, this is so amazing and thank you so much for, for bringing this film to us. And so it just, it takes, uh, it takes a little bit of perseverance at first, but uh, you know, I think that uh, these films have proven themselves to be kind of staple of cinema and, uh, and you know, just the fact that all of us have had such you know, uh, different viewpoints of what, what the films are, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, you know, speaks for, for, for the genre. I'm cur curious. I mean, this is, you know, going back to when um, uh, Sandy was making My American Cousin. Did you did you feel some of the sort of same resistance and sort of going? I mean, this is obviously a very different time for for the Canadian film business back then too. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there were. Uh, it was probably about two years of hearing no, no. It this has not been done before, and uh, no, you're not going to be, uh, you know, the first to tell the girl's story. 
and um, you know you've never directed a feature and you've only done one dramatic short but on the other end of it having made it when we screened it in Moscow some big old Russian guy would come up and say, in Russia, it is the same with the mothers and their daughters. And screening it in Sydney, Australia, a beautiful Indian actress came up and she said, oh, I had a boyfriend just like that. And I said, and did he have a big fancy car? And she said, no, but he had a really nice bicycle. <laughs> so I think that the coming of age stories translate. You know, they, they travel well. It just yeah, I guess part of the thing is they just have to kind of, you know, like like in like a news story, they have to exist. You have to show them because I think that I mean I certainly I think there's probably um, you know all kinds of people you're sort of pitch and need to get on board to make a movie. I mean I think that something I think probably is is a big part of the hesitation is like, well what what can you bring that's fresh? You know well, how do you I mean was that something very much on the minds of um, I mean starting with Andrew for instance? I mean how how do you make a, a fresh approach to this kind of territory that has been so explored? Yeah, I mean that's. It's difficult to do, and it's also actually just very difficult to pitch because, like Neve says, you go in, and as soon as you say coming of age, you see the eyes glaze over, and you're like, hello, hello, hello. And uh, it's, it's really hard to say, no, but this is going to be different because you hold a film in your, in your mind and your heart, and you know that it, it has unique qualities and that it deserves to be told. Uh, but finding a way to actually communicate what about that that is going to actually make it different in a, in a way that will be meaningful. Um, is is very it's challenging because it not only is it such a saturated genre it's what emerging filmmakers tend toward um, and whether that's because uh, the, it's an experience in our lives that is more like it's closely relatable in terms of you know they say write what you know there's we're more likely to have a personal experience out of that age that we've kind of had a chance to reflect on and think is worth telling but there are just so so many of them so it is. It is hard to to pitch, and it's also hard to find. But I think when you continue to work on your story and how you want to tell it, it becomes more obvious to you what's going to make it unique. Um, and so that was never my concern. wasn't actually making it its own film with its own voice. It was actually just getting the opportunity to do so. I'm curious too. I mean, Halima, for instance. I mean, what was your? I mean, was that something? I mean, uh, was this also a time, I mean, thinking about sort of, especially thinking about that sort of point about how it is territory that young filmmakers, emerging filmmakers, tend to gravitate, gravitate towards because, I mean, that stuff is still very fresh. I mean, it's sort of the same time you do, you, there's periods in your life where, you know, I think and there's also um, the fact that I think some of us or many of us feel 14 forever. So I think that stuff stays fresh. But certainly when you were sort of coming to sort of developing Nina, like what was, I mean, was this, were, you, were you very much thinking about that time of your life? And was there something, were there, were there many questions that arose out of that time for yourself that you wanted to explore? Well, actually, in the beginning, um, the theme, the subject was about motherhood. <laughs> so it's only after when I was developing the idea and writing that um, it became a teen mother. The, the, the main character became a teen mother, so it happened secondly, uh, not uh, initially. And um, so, but um, there are many mm, films uh, on this subject too, so it's, it, it, I had to find something really special, originality and very personal with the character and with the situation. So um, the, the, the film deals with the very central and specific uh, moments in the life of, on the, in the re relationship be between this teen mother and her baby. And so I, I concentrated on this. So I don't know if it answers the question, but <laughs> it, it, it was not uh, something about my, well, it was not about my, my nostalgia about uh, teenage, teenage time, but uh, more about my, about the, the, the motherhood um, question. And uh, actually it's, it, there's two themes that blends together. Well, I, I think you, I was just thinking about the, the word nostalgia definitely is something that comes up when you start talking about coming of age films and these sorts of stories where, you know, I mean, that you are sort of looking back. I mean, it, and I'm curious if any of the panelists think that's a, that's a particular danger to kind of look back on youth uh, from this sort of older perspective and, and have the rose colored glasses or just kind of, you know, perhaps see things as you'd like to remember them as opposed to how they were. Yes, uh, just uh, f mm, for me, um, there's something because I was a very, I was a too serious teenager, <laughs> so I started to rebel, rebel later, too late. So maybe through this movie, I tried to, <laughs> I don't know, but uh, see myself more rebel uh, 
uh, then uh, I, sh I, I, I it's maybe a regret that I <laughs> try to transfer in the movie. I don't think that there's something inherently right or wrong with taking that nostalgic lens, but it's definitely a choice that really affects the kind of movie you're going to make. I mean, Stand By Me is an incredibly nostalgic film, and it's still a very beautiful story, but I know that for me, when I was, I wanted to make a film that felt very anchored and present in uh, what that moment is like without any of that veneer of looking back and being like, oh, that was so lovely, and trying to get to the what feels like an both the, the excitement and the adrenaline and, and the wonder of it, but also the callous cruelty and all of the other things and just trying to present them, although in a narrative arc, but as as honestly as I, I could. So I think it just depends on the kind of movie you wanna make, but I, I'm, I'm not a huge, like maybe sentimentality isn't as much my thing, but I love Stand By Me, so I don't know. And I'm curious about Sandy's take too, because I mean certainly, I mean my American cousin emerges at a time you know, when the 50s were very romanticized, and there was very that kind of the, the, the view of sort of the happy days view of the 50s was still very prevalent. I mean, and the movie works sort of against and with that in very delightful ways, I've always thought. So, I mean, we, sorry. I'm, I'm not sure what the question the is. The question is basically how are you thinking about sort of presentations of, of the 50s and sort of thinking about, like, you know, uh, for my American cousin, was, it, was nostalgia a factor for you or, or something you avoided? Well, I've never understood exactly what the difference between nostalgia and sentimentality is, but um, I really was kind of um, tickled pink to be able to completely embellish, uh, you know, the reality of the situation. You know, I mean, it was true. My American cousin did show up. In reality, he never even let me in his car. But I was able to take a whole bunch of other experiences that had happened over the years and cram it all into one weekend. So it was sort of like an opportunity to uh, embellish the childhood memories. Well, I guess that's a big part of the process, too. Maybe uh, Kyle would like to speak to that. Just kind of like how, you know, it's, 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 there's, there's an interesting area, too, where it's kind of there is this autobiographical content that certainly is feeding these kind of, you know, these sort of portraits of childhood or youth. Um, but they are fictionalized. I mean, they are transplanted in other characters, people who are not like yourself, perhaps. I mean, was that sort of part of the process for you? Yeah, so I I wrote the characters sort of around, like, a vague, uh, like, assembly of other people and things around me growing up. Nothing, like, directly happened, but I'd, I'd hear about things that happened. I know when I was pitching um, the film to people in Toronto, I'd say it's about these kids who steal their pickup truck, and people in Toronto would be like, like what? And when I went back home and I was like finding locations and things and I'd say what it's about, they're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> so it was just like, it was, it was to be a typical sort of reflection of uh, that environment and that lo like location in rural Canada rather than like a direct copy of my own life. And I'm curious from, 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 from Neve's take about the process of sort of watching Stephen develop Closet Monster, which I think probably of all the films here, the most sort of ex extreme, you know, kind of it's, it's the most sort of surreal it's sort of in terms of its sort of take on a lot of these sorts of kind of core adolescent anxieties. I mean, was that sort of, I mean, in, in, in that process, was it sort of hard to kind of figure out like how, how much to push it or, or to push it even further? I mean, what was it kind of like trying to determine, you know, how much, uh, how much stylization was, 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 was required? Well, there's no need to push it further. It was pushed pretty far right from the start. Uh, you know, I, it, it was interesting because I first met Stephen uh, a few years back before he went to the film center. Right after uh, he graduated from um, from Ryerson, or was about to, uh, and he had this vague idea of this film. And and uh, and at that point, I, I I felt that you know, well, first mostly because I myself am one of those people that then is hearing a pitch about coming of age and thinking, oh no, not a coming of age film. Uh, and uh, and at that point. I'd been working on a, uh, just finished a film, I think, or about to finish a film called The Boy Smells Like Fish, which is also a coming of age film. So I thought, ah, enough of that. But, uh, but of course, Stephen has a very unique kind of uh, aura and presence. And, you know, a lot of times for me as, a, as someone who's uh, taking uh, pitches, and, and especially in the past few years when I've been working a lot with, uh, with younger filmmakers, uh, I, I really responded to him as a person, you know, and, and uh, 
So I said, uh, well, great, you know, this sounds interesting. And, and uh, you know, the pitch was very, very emotional, as Stephen tends to be sometimes, uh, which is great. Uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and basically sent him to school <laughs> for two years uh, and said, you know, you go to the film center and see what happens. And, uh, and after, you know, a year and him kind of pursuing this, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it seemed like he was, you know, he was really, uh, you know, going to not let go of this particular uh, film and it was so inside him and it was so much his you know his own story but mixed with you know kind of uh, all kinds of um, uh, you know horror elements and fantasy and, and uh, it was really really interesting and at that point I thought um, my two young uh, younger colleagues who were working with me who were kind of uh, you know coming through the ranks would be a really perfect film for them to to actually be first producers on too, and and so it kind of all came together with that. So Kevin Crixt and Fraser Ash, who's here, uh, you know, kind of took it over, and and uh, and it became you know it became kind of an, an all around first time effort, and then you know it was which is what was so amazing when it it's done. Uh, uh, as well as it has. I'm so proud, like a dad, you know, like <laughs> they're all my kids and it's all worked out <laughs> and it's fine. So, yeah, so that's how, how the, the, you know, how, how um, s that journey evolved. It's funny because just thinking about that sort of atmosphere where you're actually, I mean, certainly, you know, when you're making a movie about young people, you are working with young people, which can, it certainly is, uh, uh, you know, brings a certain kind of energy that you're going to get from, you know, that, that you may not get from other experiences. I mean, I, so, I mean, one thing I was really curious about is just, is, is, is kind of like, um, really sort of trying to, f you know, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll talk also about the stories, but I mean, finding the, the, the people, like finding the people you needed, especially the actors. I mean, and when they are often unprofessional uh, or non-professional, not that they're unprofessional, but when they're non-professional first timers, I mean, what, what was the process for each of you sort of trying to find these people you, you, you needed uh, in front of the camera? Some of them are unprofessional. <laughs> um, I mean, for for us, for casting Sleeping Giant, it was um, it was all very very protracted process because um, I think we knew instinctively that the kind of kids that we wanted for that film uh, it, there was no way that there's no 13 or 14 year old in the world who has the craft that we could pull them out of of Toronto and bring them up and ask them to be these characters. So it became really clear quickly that what we actually needed to do is go and find kids who were as close to the characters that were written as possible. And to do that, we went up and spent weeks. We went to every single high school and drama club and to the mall handing out flyers like weirdos and the entire thing and saw uh, you know, literally hundreds of kids by the end of it. Uh, to f and we ended up, it was a Kijiji ad that one of our actors responded to uh, and just showed up without a script or a time and was like, oh, here there's a movie. And we in we interviewed our kids first and, s and right away, you know, he came out for the wrong role, but we knew right away, this is our Nate, like this is our guy. And you just, I think, have to build it out that way. And for us, it was a lot of workshopping and seeing who could work together. But then you have a lot of people who have never been on a set. And I think especially for a feature, it's a marathon. It really is to, to make a feature. And so having the, the stamina and, and keeping motivation up and, and understanding that there are a lot of people who are here giving everything that they've got. And that's what's expected of you every single day. So it was, it was a, like a steep learning curve, but a really wonderful experience working with actors who ha like hadn't really acted before but were willing to bring so much of themselves to the characters. And, and Sandy, too? When I got the idea from my American cousin, Margaret Langrick immediately came to mind. Uh, she was a girl who lived across the street from me, and um, you know we were fr family friends. And um, so I wrote the script with Margaret Langrick in mind, and would watch her for her bits, and she'd be watching me for my bits. Uh, but of course, the funding agencies and poor Peter O'Brien and almost everybody else in position of in positions of authority did not want to cast the girl from across the street. Uh, they thought that was, you know, taking a chance on me, taking a chance. But um, I completely and totally insisted on it because, to me, it wouldn't have been. It, it, it wouldn't have been the film without her because uh, she had the right blend of obnoxious and precocious uh, that I was kind of looking for. And then John Wildman, I'm not sure if he's here or not, but anyway, I met John Wildman at an audition here in Toronto, and when I first saw him, I thought he's way too gorgeous, he's too beautiful. No, not what I had in mind at all. Uh, but when I saw him next to a very young kind of 
um, Gorky girl, he was, there was something quite sweet about him. And so it was in that call back at the audition that I thought, oh my goodness, he's got a really lovely something about him. I'm go and so I went back and rewrote the part of Butch. Uh, and most of the other characters, I think we picked up in Penticton a little bit the same, but um, you know, as you, where you audition a whole bunch of kids. What we did was set up a camera and asked the high school kids to come down, and we played some rock and roll music and got them to move, uh, you know, c to see who could dance, who was comfortable in front of the camera, and who looked good on the camera. So that's kind of how we did our casting. Um, it was really important to me when we were like casting to cast locally as opposed to casting in Toronto. So all the actors are like, they've never done screen acting at all. They're, um, some, well, one of them hadn't even really done theater acting. Um, so I think that was the biggest hurdle. They're all like fantastic kids, like and amazing to work with. But I think just like working with the tools and like trying to form a vocabulary with them was the hardest part. Thank you. So <coughs> for Nina, we did um, an open call uh, cast, and uh, also it was important for, for me to find the, the Nina, the main character, in the neighborhood where the story takes place, because it's uh, like um, a working class, working class neighborhood in Montreal. So for me, it was important that the, 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 the actress comes from uh, there, but um, we found the secondary roles and the extra there, but not the main role. So I finally found her on the agency uh, site. I was looking for pictures, and and when I saw her pictures, um, it was really obvious for me that uh, she had this space. What I was looking for: the authenticity, the the, the natural, the the. the, the I, I needed her to be strong and, and fragile at, at the same time, and finally it was her, and she, she comes from uh, Quebec City, <laughs> so not at all from Montreal, but she had uh, something very mature inside her, so it was her, and her name is uh, Elisabeth Tremblay-Gagnon, and she's, uh, she's, uh, she's fantastic, yeah. And well, that's, I mean, actually, it's funny because uh, many of you brought this up, and it's certainly um, something that, that I think that all these films share is this incredible sense of place. I mean, place and often period, in terms of sort of time and when things are happening. Um, and it's amazing to think that maybe that is something I think that kind of um, a great coming of age film is that there's a big component there of certainly kind of evoking uh, an environment. It's not just about the people, it's just how they are kind of indivisible from this place where they are. And it's certainly something that I think is kind of. Um, becomes very important. We, um, and so I mean, that, and that's something. I mean, well, I mean, for for instance, for for me, even looking at sort of the development of Closet Monster, was this was it was it sort of a fundamentally St. John's thing? I mean, at, at every point. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think you you can say that for most or almost uh, coming of age is coming of age in a place uh, because coming of age uh, is an inner expression of usually uh, you know a younger filmmaker an emerging filmmaker as someone said I think Andrew you know it comes from some from within it's a story that you know um, so yes definitely in 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 the case of closet monster it had to be from uh, st. John's it had to be the story of this boy growing up in that particular community uh, and I think that's um, that's the beauty of it but actually all of these are exactly that you know where you know Penticton you know I mean who would who would set a film in Penticton? Although it's one of the most beautiful places on earth, uh, I think, and and because of that film, I've gone back there numerous times, and I only drink Okanagan wine, and uh, <laughs> so uh, and that's actually true. Uh, so you know, it's a it it, it does come from uh, I think a place is 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 absolutely crucial to to the um, I think in the minds of the filmmakers that create them, the place is just so strong that you can't sort of extricate it from. You know, in the films that I mentioned before, like Amarcord or uh, or Quatre Cent Coups, or any of you know, they come from a place too. You know, and that's the beauty of them, and that's the splendor of watching them as you're watching the emergence of of uh, uh, of a person in front of you, the ca so-called coming of age. But also, you're watching it within the context of a place that is exotic and amazing. You know, it seems like it has to be tied to a place because that's one thing you have no freedom over when you're in that age. You're stuck wherever it is you are. You don't have any agency to say, well, I'm going to pick up and move wherever, like whether it's a small town or a big city or whatever, 
the coming of age has to be inherently tied to a place because that is inherent to the experience. And um, I really wanted to set mine at the ranch where I grew up. I insisted on shooting it in the house where I'd grown up. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a big fight all the way along the line. And I did want to shoot it in the Okanagan because I think it's one of the most beautiful parts of the country. And it's kind of interesting that a month ago when I was in Los Angeles picking up the DCP, we screened it. And um, the guy behind the console, a kid about 18 years old, said, oh, Sandy, I like your film. Was the scenery real? <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing just to think that that's, yeah, people, you know, it, it, it does, actually it's funny. I actually had the same moment I was watching recently. I'm like, wow, that's really good green screen. It's like, oh, no, <laughs> that's just a mountain and a lake. That's for reals. Uh, but certainly, that's, and it's something that I think that kind of is, is, I mean, having that kind of specificity is something I think that's something that we, we, we treasure out these coming of age films as well. I mean, especially the great ones, they just feel like they really are rooted somewhere, they're rooted in experience, they're rooted in, in, in a specific environments, and that's something that we you don't necessarily get from all kinds of other films. I mean, they really have to be like that. And one thing, too, I was really kind of curious about, too, especially, you know, um, in, in, in sort of dealing as, with young actors, I mean, because one thing that also connects many of these films is, is sex, and the sort of first rumblings, maybe not rumblings, maybe more like earthquakes or whatever, it's, but this, this, this is something that definitely is a sort of very, you know, becomes a very sort of charged part of many of these stories. Um, and I'm curious about how, um, first of all, how that sort of became, you know, that, how that as, a, as a theme, the sort, of, the sort of sexual awakening or sort of suspicion that something else is, the life is maybe about this something else. Uh, kind of plays in each of these films, uh, and also how you deal with young actors when sort of dealing with sort of perhaps sort of more potentially sort of troublesome area when you actually are kind of dealing with very young actors who um, maybe don't have the perspective that you do as, as an artist. Yeah. No one's jumping for that one. Yeah, go. Andrew, Andrew you picked up the mic. Um, yeah, I, I think it's certainly such a like a, a a critical personal development that happens uh with people and it's it's as a storyteller it's also like a very rich thing to get into with character because it is so complex uh and and can be often confusing and and many different things and uh, all these other things like with these intense feelings you end up with jealousy betrayal and all the hallmarks of you know a, of a great narrative too uh, so I think it's n not surprising that people focus in on that. I think it is hard to, you know, I, I am envious of some filmmakers who can deal quite explicitly with, with sex in, in this genre because I definitely had felt I almost had to skirt around it because I don't know that I was, like, c comfortable enough to be working in that space. Uh, but I think when you're working with... with um, your actors when it comes to these sorts of things, I, I don't know, sometimes... I think there are different ways to approach it. I think um, for me, it, it's it's conversations that like are context specific with each actor about a certain scene, and sometimes it's about I'm like a scene's going to be lensed in a particular way, and we're not going to have the conversation because if these act if these young actors all know exactly what's happening in the scene, none of them are going to be able to be present in it because these characters aren't supposed to to be a aware of all these things. So to, for it to play naturally and for the everyone to not like freak out about like the subtext of a scene, uh, then like I think as a director, there are times where you choose to like shape and withhold what different characters know about a particular scene. And, and Sandy, with the same thing when you're dealing with all these sort of like, you know, um, 50s, hot-blooded 50s adolescents, it was sort of a, uh, you have sort of similar sort of subtext in mind that maybe you weren't necessarily letting the cast know about? Uh, it was a little bit tricky because um, I think back then in 1959, there were rules. Everybody knew the rules. You were either a good girl or a bad girl. Everything above the waist was okay. That was it. And um, to explain uh, necking, uh, you know, and uh, that kind of stuff. I remember explaining that to the actors, and then finally one of the actors said, oh, you mean foreplay. And I went, oh, okay, fine, yeah, foreplay. Uh, and I remember that we had to do a little bit of um, uh, rehearsals for what we called the necking scene in the Cadillac when Butch is with Shirley. Uh, and at first the two actors were very uncomfortable, and um, gradually they warmed up to each other, and I would say cut and cut again. 
and and for Kyle too. I mean, I guess maybe not so much like the sexual component, but certainly very emotionally charged. I mean, what I mean, what is the process? I mean, I mean, did you have to be, I think, quite protective with young actors when sort of dealing with that kind of material? Yeah, there. Yeah, there's no sexual tension really at all. But especially in the scene in the blanket fort where you hear the parents, we had to like sort of explain it. They were all from like good families and stuff. So we sort of had, and there's a lot of swearing and a lot of vulgarity. So we had to sort of, we didn't have that those sounds on set, but they sort of knew and they had to be explained. And I sat with their parents and we all talked about it in advance, um, just what was happening behind the scenes. And then, yeah, we had to be very careful on set involving the logistics and stuff with the actors. And Halima too, like what was the sort of, um, I mean, sort of going, I mean, especially with the sort of like, I mean, if, if people have seen Nina, which is, is um, screening tonight, is that the, uh, when's, when's the next screening for Nina? What? Uh, Nina, when is Nina screening again? When? Yeah. Tonight at oh, tonight. nine. Yeah. Oh, great. Uh, because it opens with, I think, one of the most sort of um, kind of emotionally fraught scenes or sequences I remember from seeing any of the, the, the shorts this year. We just have this kind of very claustrophobic uh, sequence of a young mother, maybe 15, uh, with a very loud and upset baby for a very long time. <laughs> so, I mean, was it, it, it? I mean, that. To, to, what, I mean, what is it like to sort of create that kind of environment on, and to to get that kind of moment when you're dealing with um, with young performers? Well, we 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 spend time in the in this in the the apartment where she lives. So we had the opportunity to have the location uh, a month uh, before the the shoot. So we spent time. To, she spent time to get spent time to, uh, there, and she she we did um, uh, coaching and we 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 tried to we, we we didn't wait the first day of shooting to 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 develop this. So um, I think it's a question a question of uh, spending time in the places and uh, try to uh, to to to. to to um, understand the situation, if, 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 even if it's it's not her own situation in real life, but I had the chance. I have to say that I had the chance to to meet this wonderful young actress because she understood so fast and so easily, and uh, especially during the auditions, I, I met maybe twenty five young girls, and uh, most of them, you know, when I I I gave different directions. They often stay in the same path, the same kind of play. But uh, Elizabeth had this, um, she can play a very large um, uh, kind of, uh, I don't know the word in English I'm looking for. Range? Yeah, yeah. A range, yeah. exactly, a range of plays. So it was really easy for her, really easy. So, and maybe I don't know, it, for it's for it was my first fiction. I used to work in a documentary. And um, for me, I, I think it was—I think it was a chance to work with the young, uh, with teenagers, because it was easy to communicate. And um, for me, it was a very uh, good experience and uh, it's a very easy one, actually. <laughs> well, it's funny because thinking about even—I mean, it's funny because I always think about sort of you know, generation gaps. And I think because of the way you know uh, life tends to be i think those generation gaps to get to be faster and faster such that you know you're you're 2 years older than someone you may actually have a lot less in common than you might have presumed um, and i guess even from starting from Neve's perspective like i mean that's sort of like i mean you are always sort of surprised when you're sort of thinking about sort of times you worked with sort of you know teen, you know sort of younger cast i mean did it, i mean are, are are teenagers always uh, is, are there some fundamentals to sort of teenage behavior or teenage ritual that you're always seeing or that is it always is always fresh is always surprising uh, well, I mean, from my perspective, I, in, I, I, you know, I, I'm working more with the filmmakers, uh, you know, so I, 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 I can't really answer the question to cast because, uh, you know, I, I'm, you know, I feel it's really important that <laughs> that I, I'm not really that involved with that. I'd never go to auditions. I never. I think it's, it should be a, a um, you know, a direct relationship between a director and their cast member. But I can speak to uh, working with younger filmmakers. Uh, themselves, which is a you know a conscious choice that I've made uh, in in the past you know, I don't know decade or, or at least seven years, uh, you know because I just think it's a, such a crucial thing is to to keep <laughs> to keep the whole system going and and uh, and for me it's just uh, uh, you know and, uh, the 
the most fantastic rejuvenating uh thing that i can do you know this of course i have you know i have colleagues that i've worked with my whole life like don mckellar or paul gross or francois girard or people like that they're amazing great filmmakers that i you know nurture my my lifelong um you know associations with and we keep on doing things uh all the time uh but working with young filmmakers uh uh, has such a, 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 a beautiful reward, and especially if the films um, are doing well, like Closet Monster, you know, it just uh, <laughs> it, 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 it gives me a, um, a special pride and joy and, and, and uh, y- you know, to, to be able to sort of bring someone to the world of filmmaking and, uh, uh, and, and, and continue that cycle. Great. And it's, yeah, it's been fantastic to see what the sort of life of that film already. Um, uh, and that's, I mean, I think it's kind of it's something that sort of, I think, kind of, uh, is is heartening that a film that that can sort of can ha- make that kind of connection with people and be so kind of uh, bold and idiosyncratic and uh, I mean and I guess that's one thing I was gonna uh, I'm curious about the, the panelists' the pr- perspective as well if they if there was a worry as they were sort of developing films that like is this is this too personal am I making something that really only is going to make sense and sort of have relevance to me and maybe you know, uh, you know, uh, my cousins, <laughs> as the case may be. I mean, is there is there enough here for other people to sort of find a way into these sort of experiences? Was that ever something on, on people's minds? A hundred percent. Like, I thought that most of the way through up until almost the end, and even when we were doing screenings with cuts in class and stuff, I still was like, people weren't getting certain things. And yeah, I thought that a hundred percent all the way through until we finally assembled all the sound and the sound came in and it made a world of difference. I felt um, I don't know. I, I I think that that was definitely something that go that goes through your mind. For me, setting was a huge part of that. I I grew up spending my summers up on the North Shore of Lake Superior, and I have a huge personal affection for that landscape. And I I was I I wanted to share what that's like, but I was very afraid that to a lot of other people it's just like tundra and like <laughs> some water. Um, and so I, I was I was scared that maybe what I thought was special really really wasn't, but I guess that's the challenge of it. It's, this is special to me. How can I communicate it so that an audience can watch it and, and feel what I feel about it? I think the more specific you are, the better it travels, that uh, people can really kind of relate to it. Uh, because I have made a whole bunch of documentaries, I wanted my American cousin to look like a documentary. And I've always been kind of troubled about how much do you change and how much do you stick to the facts. Uh, In real life life, my cousin Butch died. And for a long time, when I was pitching the film, I wanted that ending. I wanted this really sad kicker ending. He died, you know, when he was only 21. And uh, everybody said, ooh, Sandy, what the, that's not a very happy ending. Mm-hmm. You know, the, it's a happy <laughs> film. And then you s- hit us with this ending. And I thought, oh, you have to know he's going to die. <laughs> and then, um, and I insisted on that for quite a long time. And then uh, finally I realized, no, this is not the right ending. So um, I changed that because uh, everybody told me it was a bad ending. <laughs> I think also definitely when first writing, I had that experience of going... Oh God! Like the people are people are gonna see this movie and they're gonna know that it's them in it, or or that people are gonna see me in it and things that I'm I, like. Do I want to actually? I want to hide. Like that's, I'm behind the camera for a reason. I want to share this, but I don't want people to know what's me and what's not. But as you keep working and drawing on all these other external uh, sources of inspiration and combining people into one character and things, it gets a little. You get to hide in the smoke and the mirrors a bit more about what's actually true. I got to reinvent my entire family, and um, I remembered that um, somebody once asked my mother, well, how do you feel about the way Sandy portrayed you? And my mother said she was very kind to me. (laughs) And it's true, I was. Yeah, I felt that too. I like it's entirely fictional, but I thought that people were gonna see things or, or judgments about me and like my family in because th- these kids live in a terrible family and my family's awesome. So I was afraid that people were gonna make judgments about me based on what they see and assume that it's autobiographical or autobiographical when it's not. Same thing for me. I, I, I've been asked, "Is it your story?" <laughs> actually, because <laughs> I'm a mother too. So people, some people thought that. Uh, was my story, but um, no, uh, but I was really, I I used to live in this 
neighborhood for almost nine years and the youth community center was at the corner of my street. So well, it's a part of my story. I mean, I have this contact, this I developed this relationship with the youth people. So there's something from me, but it's not by, yeah, we have a part of us, I think, in every every project, every creation we make. And I could truthfully say that Closet Monster had nothing to do with my childhood in, <laughs> in the 60s in Tel Aviv, Israel. <laughs> not, not a lick, not yeah, one not thing. Th absolutely nothing. <laughs> no. Maybe the repression, actually now that I'm thinking of it, maybe the repression part of it. And <laughs> uh, but that was a bit later, so yeah, nothing. Well, I'm curious too, because I mean, this is certainly something that, I mean, I, I think uh, like in any kind of artistic work, I mean, there's always sort of questions that, uh, the questions that are maybe front of your mind when you're making things, and then there's the other questions that you maybe didn't realize were actually sort of part of part of why you were doing what you were doing, and and I'm curious about that of that of the process of creating these films. Um, I mean, create. I mean, that, 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 that were there any revelations that are when you cut to the end of this process and go, oh, okay, I, that's why I cared about that, or that's why that that part of the story is here. I mean, is there any sort of moments like that for you? Anyone want to? Kyle's reaching for a mic. Oh, just in just in terms of your actually, well, I'm curious actually about your what, what, in terms of you because you've been actually uh, that, that goes good to uh, to play to Sandy as well because you've been this is a film that's uh, that's had this this life for 30 years. I mean, what what new things do you see in the film? Are there things that surprise you about what your sort of take was on on this on this kind of story? Well, I know that it turned out a lot better than what I expected, uh, which was a delightful surprise. Uh, maybe the thing that surprised me the most was that um, when we screened it in New York City, they were kind of critical of the way I portrayed the Americans. <laughs> Uh, and the same thing happened in Los Angeles, and I thought, yikes, these guys don't have quite as much a sense of humor about themselves as us Canardians do. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Oh, I, I, I was just going to say, I think I was surprised more in the, in the, like, in production and then into post, and how I had a script that felt, like, alive in a way, but how what everyone else on my team brought to it, how it started to actually have its own life, and that moment when you feel like it actually has a heartbeat and that your characters have a depth that goes beyond what you put on the page. And th when when you start to assemble it and you feel um, like, it's it's kind of, it's like, Fra you know, it's a bit of a Frankenstein thing. You have all these parts and you put them together and you throw the switch and you're like, uh. And that day when you realize that it's actually, even however flawed, that it's actually alive is a really wonderful thing. And and uh, and Kyle and Halima, so that sort of moment too, where it's like, oh, it's this thing now. It is this thing that has this other life. It's not, you know, it, it exists in the world like that. I honestly don't know if I'm at a place of wisdom enough to reflect on it. <laughs> I'm still sort of figuring that out. Well, um, actually, it's the same thing that you said. It's what ha what happened when the whole team, when everybody works on the same thing. It's actually it. Finally, it's the same thing that I had in my mind, but it's much better than I thought it would be, because of the participation of everybody, everyone uh, in the team. That's great. Well, I'm happy it worked out. <laughs> and I guess also, like, I'm just, it, it definitely is. I mean, what what kinds of interactions have you had with audience members at this point? I mean, with, with, I mean, all these different films. I mean, what what has been sort of most meaningful in terms of of, of seeing it, um, you know, connect with you know audiences? I can say for Closet Monster, something that uh, in that was I found really interesting is uh, that we've had a, a a number of screenings uh, in uh, at festivals around the world and and uh, uh, and. Uh, in a in a place like for instance in in Busan, you know um, that I wasn't actually at the screening, but I I, I heard so much about it is that uh, you know the film kind of opened up uh, y you know feelings uh, the sort of the, the repression and and dealing with the issues that uh, the main character in the film deals with uh, really really enlightened people in a in a very closed society like Korea where. Uh, you know the father and son relationship is so strong, and 
and uh, you know deviating from that is just unheard of. And so there are young men in, in, in the audience that came up to Stephen after and had tears in their eyes and said, well, you know, this is me, but I can't ever tell anyone, you know? And, and so those kind of things are the, you know, I think those are the reasons we make movies <laughs> is, is, is that, you know, you, you, you open, even as if it's one person, you know, that you open up to that, that so sees something in your movie that can help them or, or make them realize something about themselves. That's such a beautiful, uh, you know, and rewarding thing. Um, it's been absolutely thrilling for me to see the affection uh, that people still have uh, for that old movie, My American Cousin. And um, even when I screen it now, people will come up to me and quite often they'll sort of look behind their shoulder before they say, oh, I, had a I had a cousin just like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so then I get to hear their stories. So uh, that's what I like is, you know, they watch the movie and then they want, they, they, they need to tell me their story about their cousin. I've had fun seeing how different cultures respond to the film. We've been to uh, I th like over 40 festivals in the last eight months or whatever it's been. I haven't gone to all of them, but I've been to like, I don't know, 15 or something. And like different, yeah, different cultures laugh at different places. Even etiquette in the theater is so different. In in, in India, I was, so I was in Mumbai and I was like dr driving around in a rickshaw in a city that has the population of Canada essentially in a city. And I was like, how are they possibly going to relate to this movie about like four kids in the middle of nowhere? Um, but and you get there, and people in movie theaters there are always texting and on their phone. And I was like, oh my god, they hate it. But it's actually that's totally culturally normal to just be texting and doing your thing. But then when they like something, they would cr like clap and hoot at the screen. And it was so neat to see how those responses could be could be different and uh, I, I mean no audience is the same we were just in palm springs and that was like the worst audience we ever had <laughs> for our film because it w i mean it was almost uniformly like uh 65 plus probably fairly conservative hey hey, hey wait and <laughs> there was a lot those of those like, can be interesting yes people the interesting people but not people <laughs> who love my movie i think they're not the demo and so there were a lot of shocks and like gasps and like you know like if it, it, it fell pretty flat and then so it's it's interesting when you get comfortable enough with how your film is doing it's fun to be able to to sit in and see even if people don't like it as an, a sort of a cultural experiment every time you play the film this is a bit smaller but my personal favorite reaction is my nephew is absolutely horrified of my film like horrified and it's not scary uh, he's just horrified of it and he's almost as old as the youngest actor just terrified like sort of like hiding under blankets while I mean is he is it truly like a horror movie? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, for me, <coughs> I didn't have yet a lot of um, audience um, experience because it's, it's just the beginning of the <laughs> the story of the <coughs> the, the film. But uh, this week in Montreal, it was at the Centre Fille on Monday, and uh, um, the audience uh, loved at a place that I wouldn't think that they would. <laughs> so I was very surprised and happy about that because uh, well, it was I, I, I liked it that this moment was not so dramatic that <laughs> I wanted to. It, 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 it was nice, yeah. Yeah, I like the, the experience. Um, and I guess also just, I mean, it's been we do have a lot of sort of like sort of emerging and aspiring filmmakers in the house too. If, if people could talk about what the sort of biggest challenge was. I mean, if there was a moment in making these films that you just thought, well, this is this is not going as I'd hoped. <laughs> this is not, this could all be sort of going, uh, going south on me right now. I think probably every moment yeah. that, <laughs> uh, like every single moment, every every day, every, until you finally get it out of your hair, right? It's like, uh, you know, it, yeah, and even then, sometimes with different films, not the ones we were talking about, you know, you want to get it out of your hair forever, right? But uh, <laughs> you guys wouldn't know that you're too young. But <laughs> no, I mean, every moment of making a film is a moment of self-doubt, I think. Uh, and <laughs> so, yeah. For me, the, the hardest moment was during the shooting because of the, because we had to do it very fast. And uh, not like in documentary when we take time. And I thought that we would have more time. I was maybe very naive, but uh, you know, today you have to make film, you have a small amount of, of time for shooting. And it was difficult for me. Just it's the producer's uh, fault, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. 
Um, there was one moment. It was the first day of shooting and the second set that we were at, and it's where the truck is stuck, and uh, it didn't get to where it was supposed to get. Like, it had this ground had frozen the night before and then thawed, so it was just like soup. So that was the moment where we were like, "Oh sh- shit!" <laughs> and like, we just like we had to completely redo all of our storyboards and everything, and like all our shot list in maybe like fifteen minutes. And then we woke up the next morning to go back to that scene, and it had snowed. So we had to take sticks and bang all the snow off all the trees. That was the moment where I was like, okay, this this might sink. This might not go so well. I, I think I could, I mean, I could fill the entire hour of just telling you all the times where I was like, well, it's done. My life's over, and this film is, is dead. Um, from from getting funding, it's so it's so hard. And then when you're making a movie with very little uh, money, like very little money, it's uh, everyone like you just don't have the maneuverability to respond to problems. Always come up, and um, money is the easiest way to solve a lot of them. Uh, and when you just have, and that's always a problem on every film. But when you like when that ceiling is so low, it's really hard to be adaptable. And we were shooting up on a lake. Uh, that was, you know, we had five days on a, never write like five days on an uninhabited island in the middle of a giant lake. Like, what was I thinking? And so we'd get, you know, we'd go out to three days in a row on our last week, we were turned away by the waves being too too high. And then uh, we like barely got out to shoot the climactic sequence and we came back and for whatever reason, we thought we'd shoot the last, at, like the last bit of the film, the last three minutes of it on the last night because it was an overnight thing and we thought it would be really nice. Everyone could give their all. Well, Everyone's plane ticket is booked back the next morning, and we have a lightning storm, and we can't set up our lights or do anything outside while this lightning storm is raging. So we're all sitting inside, just listening to the thunder rumble overhead until about 3.30 in the morning, and it cleared, and, and somehow like we just went out and banged it off. It was like the film gods were like, just so you know, we totally could have screwed you here. <laughs> Plan better next time, and you know, I don't know. I have a vivid memory of getting ready to do the final mix at the lab in Vancouver, and uh, my friend Dave Harden said, now Sandy, you're going to pay for this mix, aren't you? And of course, we didn't have any money, and I had no idea whether we were or not, but I looked him right in the eye and I said, absolutely, Dave, (laughs) you'll get paid for this mix. And he said, okay, we'll start the mix now. And I looked over at Peter O'Brien, the producer. He was reading a newspaper, and he put down his newspaper, and he said, Sandy, now you can call yourself a producer. <laughs> well, and that's, well I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased that uh, all those hardships were not so great <laughs> that it prevented you from finishing the films. And I guess I'm curious, too, because it is something that certainly, you know, plenty of major filmmakers have sort of come you know, back again and again to these sorts. I mean, certainly Fellini was somebody who kind of would kind of come back to to childhood subjects. Bergman, I mean, there's certainly it is a kind of trove for 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 many filmmakers. And um, and I guess well, we're going to go to to questions from the audience in a few minutes too. But I guess just to, uh, the last thing for the panelists, we wanted them to, to to talk about was just I mean, is this somewhere are you going to go back there? And in, in fact, Sandy, you did go back there with uh, American Boyfriends uh, a couple of years later. But what was it like, kind of coming back to that terrain? A mistake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I've struggled with that because you do I've d- I did a coming of age film and now like my inbox is flooded with coming of age scripts of, like that's what you know you've done that and so that's what people want to offer you to do more of uh, and I've I've like actively kind of had to make the decision even if it's a really great project I don't think that's the genre I want to work in next for for a number of reasons, but it, it, it is hard. You find a really great story, but you're like, ah, it's kind of, it's so similar. And it's, so I, I think for me creatively uh, and you know, career-wise, it probably makes more sense to depart and work in another space, at least for a while. Yeah, I've, I've thought about it, but I'm trying to, like as an emerging filmmaker and not particularly amazing yet, I'm trying to like, um, tr- like experience new things and try and expand and figure out what suits me the best before I would go back to another coming of age? Well, not for the moment, but never say never. <laughs> so, but uh, the, the projects I'm working on for the moment are really different. But uh, even in Nina, in this short, there there are a few themes, not only one. So um, I'm trying to work on different things. <laughs> and I can tell you Steven's next film is a coming of age film that has there's not autobiographical and that 
those same distributors who were worried about it last time are embracing it this time. So it goes you to show you the <laughs> the the price of success. <laughs> that Stephen can make as many coming of age films as he likes, at least for a while. <laughs> Until the next one. Yeah. It's only <laughs> it's only the next one that counts. So great. And if we have uh, questions from the audience, I believe we have uh, mics at the ready. Um, so if there are any there are other uh, questions in regards to uh, coming of age or just in terms of sort of the production experience for these filmmakers in general. Hi. You briefly alluded to the difficulty of getting funding. Could you... Can you hear me? You briefly alluded to the difficulty of getting funding. Could you all speak briefly about that in your own experience? Sandy, uh, Andrew's got the mic. You're doomed, Andrew. Uh, you got it. I mean, for me, it, it's that it's a, certainly a recent experience. I had a, I had a, I had a very difficult time getting funding for my film. I, I kind of thought I could go and make a bunch of short films, and if they won awards and did well, that logically then when I just showed up with a script to make a feature, people would like open up satchels of gold bullion or whatever you pay for movies with and uh it was impossible you know i the reason there's a sleeping giant short film is because i was up in pre-production when one financing fell through uh in the summer of 2013 and so we decided to make a short that year uh, which went on to have its own life and ultimately creatively really helped me retool how i wanted to make the feature but it was a whole other year i was waiting and we basically just decided you know, hell or high water. Next, we've got these kids. We love them. They're a ticking time bomb of growing up. We have one more year, and we're going to make the film next summer, no matter what. Uh, and I'm not going to give a number to what we had, but it was like I've I've made. We got through production on a budget that I've made a short film for in the past. Uh, so it's like that's the reality that you you can be faced with. But you have to decide whether or not you're just are you going to make your film or are you not. And you you can spend your whole life waiting for the opportunity for everything to fall into place, or you can just decide maybe I have to look at this as a, a constraint, but I can be creative within those constraints and find a way to still tell my story. Uh, getting the financing uh, together was uh, very difficult, and at one point I had a friend who had a brother who was married to an accountant in the Grand Cayman Islands. And um, so I was down in the Grand Cayman Islands pitching, and it looked like we could get some money from the Grand Cayman Islands. And so then I went back to the CBC and said, I think we've got some money coming in, um, so could you give us a broadcast license? And they said yes. Uh, so that was, a, that was the first money that sort of came into place was a broadcast license. I don't think that's available anymore. Um, and then, of course, the money from the Grand Cayman Islands totally fell apart because they were a bunch of sh shysters, right? Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> but because we had the CBC money, then Telefilm would come in if we could bring in a final third, and that would be the distributor. That was the tricky part. Uh, and then, of course, uh, like yourself, I think you have to go ahead. You have to just kind of get on the path. I remember being in the motel up in Penticton. My friend Joey was up there too. Anyway, we didn't know whether the financing was going to be in place until I think we were kind of like a week into the shoot. Yeah, I know it's obviously a much different scale shooting a, like a student short film, but uh, we did just that. We shot first and then funded after. <laughs> Good. Uh, well, we decided with my producer and friend to make the, the film whatever, if we have funds or not. It was really a decision in the beginning, and we had the funds at first time with SODEC and uh, con con Conseil, uh, Conseil des Arts du Québec. So we were lucky, and we did it. But what I, found, uh, what I find, still find difficult is the distribution for short films. It's really, there's no money. You have money for production. If if you have if you have the chance to have it, but nothing for distribution, so it's it's hard. <laughs> really. And uh, was, there, was there other complexities for Closet Monster in that regard? Well, I mean, I think uh, <laughs> as you saw from my colleagues here, you know, I, I think every film really is really hard to fund. Uh, you know, having gone through decades of it myself, you know, I I, I can't say. There's a single film that I've worked on, there's probably 200 of them, that I could say, wow, that fell together quickly, you know? So <laughs> um, it's why one of the realities is why we, you know, we all have 
big personalities and uh, we all believe that what we're doing is right and that's how you just have to move forward. Well, that's a good, on that tap, uh, topic. Uh, other questions? Other mics? Uh, hi. Um, I was wondering if you had any advice to somebody who was thinking of maybe writing a coming-of-age story, either uh, biographical or non-biographical, um, in terms of maybe where to draw inspiration from? Did anyone hear that? Yeah. So, so where, where, where should a, 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 a new writer come at a sort of coming-of-age story? What, what, how do you, where do you draw inspiration from? I mean, there's so many amazing films out there, and there's also a huge, like, a, as a, in literature, there's an incredible canon of, of, of beautiful works that are all so different. So if you don't have anything of your own to draw on, I think any time you're working in a, a genre and you've made that decision, the best is to know that genre as intimately as you can uh, so that you can work within it, but also understand how you can break out of it and make it your own space. And I got the idea from my American cousin when I heard a song on the radio. It was Johnny Horton singing the Battle of New Orleans. And um, I remembered my cousin coming up for a visit. And every time that song would come on the radio, my dad would get mad and tell him to turn it off. And I couldn't understand what the problem was. But uh, the song is actually all about how the uh, Americans whooped the British back in the day. So anyway, the inspiration for me came from a song uh, I think that's the trickiest part, actually, is uh, where do you get that idea from that's going to um, carry into a film? I don't know. For me, the biggest inspiration right away, like the thing I jumped to right away, and then as a launching point, like we discussed earlier, was actually the place. Um, but if I need to think of ideas, usually I just try and consume a lot of media, like songs, pictures, movies, just anything. It doesn't have to be related at all. And just like, take in whatever I can to like try and give me ideas. Well, <coughs> it might uh, sound strange, but the, in the, the inspiration in the beginning came from the, the, the neighborhood. <laughs> but finally, because I, I really like this, this neighborhood, it's really in my heart, even if I don't live there anymore. But uh, finally, in the beginning, it's, well, it was like a character in the movie, but at the end, it, it's not finally. <laughs> but... Um, so it was that. I, it has to be very personal, I think. It, it has to come from something specific and personal. So I have a question. Um, you all spoke about your moments of self-doubt, but I was just curious about your moments of uh, self-assuredness and how you use those to propel yourself forward to finish the film. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah, we just started thinking about if there, we we talked about the the sort of negative soul destroying moments. We're sort of talking about like the, the the more gratifying, positive ones that actually are the ones that hopefully get you through the process. If you can talk about any of those sorts of moments, <laughs> I don't think those exi those are your own fantasy, madam. <laughs> it's the other ones that get you through, uh, and then you know, presumably, people like your film in the end, but. Uh, it, you know, I don't know if there's a moment where you, in the middle of the process, say, well, God, I'm good at this. <laughs> I, th I think that there was a moment when we were, had, we'd been shooting My American Cousin, and we'd been watching the rushes on a steam deck, which has a very small screen. And then uh, one of the guys on the camera crew said, oh, let's book the theater, the local theater, and um, we'll see the film up on a big screen. And... What a great idea. So at around 11 o'clock, we went to the Penmar Theatre in Penticton and looked at some of the rushes, and I was completely and totally blown away. And I thought, oh, my God, it looks like a real movie. Uh, because it was big, it was glamorous, it just looked gorgeous. It was Richard Leiterman shot it, and he just did such a beautiful job on it. So that moment was very reassuring, but most of the time it was completely not reassuring at all and I learned very early on that you don't cry in front of the guys they don't <laughs> like it it makes them very uncomfortable and um, I think it was my girlfriends and um, a lot of wine that kind of got got me through it 
It, I mean, you, you raise an interesting point about like not, not crying in front of your crew. It is a good strategy. <laughs> <at> <laughs> do it alone if you're going to do uh, No, because, I mean, ultimately, I, I think as a filmmaker, if you, if you don't have self-doubt and you're not constantly questioning whether you're doing things in the best possible way, there's no way that you're really probably making anything that interesting. And you need to be able to simultaneously live in that constant state uh, while being able to actually lead a team and because other people are there and they're working their asses off on 14 plus hour days sometimes and and they're all there because they believe in it and they believe in it because you believe in it and you've convinced them to believe in it so even on those really hard days it's extra important to to be able to kind of like you know not cry in front of the guys <laughs> i found like the little things you're talking about the crew like i just remember sitting down like for lunch and someone would come by and say oh that that little bit that was that was awesome. And those little things sort of like fueled me to have enough confidence to just keep going, I found. But sometimes it's, you know, during the shooting, you, 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 you shoot a scene and you are so happy and wow, that's it. It's wonderful. But finally, during the editing, <laughs> it's not the right thing. So it's something, sometimes it's like uh, you think it's good, but it's not. So you... <laughs> You always have to doubt and uh, and uh, even if you're happy, just be careful. <laughs> and uh, Neves, do you have any moments of, uh, of 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 absolute satisfaction? You're just like, no, I'm great at this. Has it ever happened in all these movies? <laughs> well, as you get more and more uh, uh, further from the process, I was in this film where the real work was done by Fraser and Kevin, and I'm just a the guy that watches, of course, then I can sit back and think, "Wow, those guys are awesome." So that that was that was satisfying for me. But uh, I think the closer you are to the process, you either are doubting or you're delusional. <laughs> as <laughs> so, if you ever think it's good, then you're delusional, and if you ever, you know. But no, but I mean seriously, you know, of course, all of us, I think, um, have great satisfaction in what we do generally. Uh, and that's what fuels us. I, I don't know if there are specific moments where you know you 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 constantly have self doubt, but in the big picture, you know we all believe that what we're doing is kind of interesting and and uh, and can you know can in inform people and enlighten them and entertain them and all those things. And that's what drives us. Otherwise, we wouldn't. You know, I'm, I guess I'm here longer than most <laughs> uh and uh and uh you know that's what that's what makes you go on you know for for decades great other questions up there hello hello uh i got a question here um i just a little curious about uh, how can we uh show first and the fun after because i know how damn the terrible that when you got an idea but it you have no money to launch your personal project uh, or yeah that's it so <laughs> right i guess that i mean is that is that a, is that really a viable strategy to sort of you know maybe maybe not i guess it you know it's always going to be case by case i should think for us we weren't dealing with a whole lot of money so even if we weren't able to secure funding like it wouldn't have been the apocalypse since it is just a student short film, we weren't dealing with like thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. It was very, very small budget. So even if it fell through, we would have been okay, I think. Oh, that's the good old days, eh? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's important not to put in a lot of your, your personal savings into something. No, I, j I mean, that sounds uh, like uh, a joke, but uh, people do it. I've done it uh, on, you know, in, in some shorts in the past and, and you, you like even on my feature a little bit. But I think it's it's definitely not a sustainable model. And it's. Uh, yeah. Yes. And he but he also had like a, a body of wealth from being a child actor. And so he was in a particular situation where he wasn't like mortgaging a house uh, or something. Not to say it wasn't a very brave choice. But I think if you can avoid it, I definitely wouldn't like max out personal credit cards or do whatever. I'd rather look at how you can limit your means. I mean, technology is so incredible now. Mm -hmm. The the kind of the results that you can get on a camera that you can buy for a couple thousand dollars are not the difference between your film uh, playing a huge festival or not. It's the quality of the storytelling. So look at where you can put what little money you have and try to find a story that you can tell with a limited means. Work make that your creative constraint. Um, I think that's how. 
and then for the funding later, what you do is you shoot the thing with every penny you have, and then you cut it together, and you go, will you give us money now? We, it's, we promise it's actually good. And once there's something that is tangible, it's a lot less of a risk for them to come on board and give you money to finish a film, which I'd say is the one area where you still really can't scrimp and save. Post-production is expensive. Uh, to do it well and to do it right and to have your film confidently be able to come to a theater like this and play and not sound mm. like abysmal, <laughs> you know, it costs a lot of money. It's always like the legend of uh, Robert Rodriguez and uh, El Mariachi, which was a very famous example of a film that was made for $7,000. And it kind of was made for $7,000. And then they had, like, when it got sold, they had to spend, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to get that movie to a sort of playable form. But, you know. You can worry about that later. If you can get if you can get a great seven thousand dollar movie, then do then do that. I totally encourage you to go out and start shooting, even if you're not financed. Uh, I think the tricky part is to make sure that you're working with a wonderful crew who is going to support you and make you look really, really good. So maybe you only get to shoot a portion of your film, but you can then show that to somebody else and then get the rest of your funding. But I'd say get your, get your crew together. Uh, that's really, I think, as important as your financing. Other questions? Oh, let me wait for your mic. Oh, uh, sorry. Hi. <laughs> um, my question is about pitching. Um, when you guys have an idea and you go and you take it and go into a pitch, could you kind of talk about your experiences with that and uh, any advice that you have for people on what to prepare when pitching an idea? A good lookbook, like something like a visual aid. Uh, reference movies are very helpful, not in like the cheesy. It's like Die Hard meets uh, I don't know, the Flintstones. Yeah, uh, but but having really good, like if you can have good references that are somewhat recent, and especially if you're pitching for money, then make them not obscure art house films because those movies didn't make money and they don't care. Um, so, but if you can kind of triangulate it so that it's accessible to them in that way and be visual and then be prepared to tell your story, like you have to tell your story, you have to be actually able to s like walk them, walk them through this story. And, um, so it's not like a PowerPoint presentation. You're, you ultimately as a filmmaker, you're a storyteller. And if you can't tell your story convincingly, no one's going to fund it. And I'd say uh, practice telling stories and practice your pitch on anybody who will listen, whether you're on an airplane or you know in the line at line up at the grocery store and somebody asks you what are you up to, uh, get that pitch down to about I don't know two minutes, two or three minutes, and then you have to make it sound like it's the first time you've ever told anybody about it. The, uh, any Neve, any what do you? Th I'm curious because people pitch to you all the time. Like, what do you? What what works on you? Good question. Uh, I thought I was going to dodge this one. <laughs> oh, no, you're not getting off the hook. <laughs> I'm interested in that Die Hard meets the Flintstones concept. We'll, do you we'll, have talk, a we'll talk on after. That? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I I, I guess uh, for me the most important thing is is uh, is actually as I said before is the filmmaker. You know, is is the person that's pitching and and. Uh, whether I, you know, I can kind of relate to the person, you know, I mean, uh, from my perspective, I guess, you know, having, you know, uh, like a, a complete, you know, someone who's completely not done anything before, so there's nothing I can see is really, really difficult. I would, I would if, if I ever am in, in that kind of situation, I'd encourage them to go first and do something, like just anything, you know, like just shoot any material on the streets or anything that can at least assess, uh, you know, a, a, a visual style or a, or any kind of a style or any kind of a, a personal viewpoint. Uh, and then really it's about, you know, the, 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 the passion. I think the story I told about Stephen's first time, uh, you know, I, I, at that point I'd, I'd seen a short that he'd made that I thought was really interesting, but really it was... Uh, it was the person, you know, it was the emotion with which he told the story, and, and, uh, uh, and it was a terrible pay. I mean, it, you know, he, it, it didn't go well for him, and I was trying to be really nice, and he was crying, and it was, like, really, really awkward, um, but, uh, but, you know, he was telling his own story, and, and, you know, and that's why, you know, <laughs> I said I sent him back to school, uh, which I actually did. I, I said, you know, this, you know, I'd love to work with you, but, you know, you go and go and think about it, go and think more. So 
from the perspective of anyone there who's thinking about pitching, you know, you, you also, I think, have to be ready in a sense, like ready, you know, emotionally ready or, or, or just, you know, ready in terms of technique or, you know, like uh, a lot of people just want to just, I'm going to make a film. I'm going to do it now. I'm going to get someone to support me. But, you know, from the person who's trying to support you, and remember, I have to then go and get support from others, uh, you know, so it's not just me. I'm, I'm assessing when I'm looking at you, I'm assessing okay, well, how do I fund this? You know, how do I get this going? And, and, and so it's, it, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I, I want to do something uh, myself from my own perspective. I'm particularly interested in a, in a theme or in a subject or in, you know, a, an ideology or whatever it may be, a politics sometimes or, you know, just the person themselves. Uh, but then I have to take it to other steps. And so just always be ready. Don't, don't ever take anything personally. Uh, you know, be ready to have people tell you things that you may not want to hear, uh, and you know, be confident, be ready. You know, be ready on a on a on an emotional level. So I think the lesson there is that tears can work in that context. Yeah. Yeah. Tears are good, <laughs> genuine tears. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have time for one quick one. If we have anyone left, any other uh, questions out there? To uh, anyone hopping for a mic? Um, oh, here we go. This is the last one. Um, a couple of you have mentioned um, working with your team, b um, having your team ready and getting out there and shooting. Can you talk a little bit about how you built your teams? Did you already have relationships or did you hunt new people down? How did it go for you that way? I, th uh, I think the relationship between a director and the cinematographer uh, is a vital one. Uh, you have to be able to communicate and understand each other. Um, and I always thought that I would be shooting my American cousin with a cinematographer I'd done a whole bunch of documentaries with, so we had a relationship. At the last minute, he dropped out, and um, so it was, a qu it was almost like dialing for a date or something. I had to talk on the phone with a bunch of cinematographers who I'd never met, and that's how I met um, Richard Leiterman, and... Um, I liked his earlier, his, some of his films that he'd made, and I d had to just kind of take a chance. And um, luckily, uh, it worked out really very nicely, although on the first day of the shoot, I felt like uh, we were both um, kind of, I felt like we were like a bride and groom walking down the aisle, and the whole crew was going, I wonder if this marriage is going to work. You know, how long is this going to last? Is Richard going to wind up directing or is the girl going to direct? You know, that kind of thing. And it was very, very scary. But Richard and I were able to, um, like, talk through that. And I explained the situation. And, you know, uh, on that first day of the shoot, um, you know, he said, where's your shot list? And I said, you know, I've heard a lot about this shot list, but I don't know exactly what it is or how you get it. And there was a long pause, and then finally, you know, he, he said, well, what do you have? I said, I have a storyboard. And so I showed him the storyboard, and he was able to say, okay, this is your master, then you've got a close-up, then, and I, oh, okay, fine. So I think it's a question of um, communicating. Um, and a lot of the other people I had worked with before, which was a good thing, the productions designer was a guy, Phil Schmidt, that I was living with. We had two children together, so I knew him. And <laughs> Joey and I Joey and I had done a book about poetry, uh, but there were a lot of people on the set of My American Cousin, who, including me, who had never been on the set of a feature film. But we were a nice mix of um, virgins and not virgins. Uh, it's a very tricky thing, uh, but I think if you can, it, uh, it's the communication, really. Um, and p uh, plus, I was able to show them growing up at Paradise and say, this is kind of the look and the feel. And, oh, okay, so having a previous film to show was a kind of shortcut uh, to saying what I, w th you know, the tone and the feel of and the, all that kind of stuff. But it's, it's tricky. It's tricky. It doesn't always work like that. I think that's uh, all the time we have today. Uh, but thanks again to uh, all our panelists. Uh, congratulations on uh, your films. And, uh, and please come out uh, again uh, for all the screenings that are still to come. So uh, thanks very much for everyone today.
Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to TIFF Bell Lightbox. My name is Keith Benny, and I work in our adult learning department. It's our pleasure you to, uh, to welcome you to our first higher learning event of our winter season, aptly named First Things First, Coming of Age in Canadian Film, uh, of course, as part of the Canada's Top 10 Film Festival. Uh, before I introduce you to our moderator, who will then introduce you to our panelist, uh, I'd like to mention a few thank yous. On behalf of TIFF, we'd like to thank our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris, and Visa, as well as our major public supporters, the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, and the City of Toronto. We'd also like to thank our Canada's Top 10 Film Festival supporting partners, the Directors Guild of Canada, and our media partner, Now Magazine. Uh, as a charitable organization, we'd also like to thank our donors and members for making TIFF's year-round programming, educational, and community outreach initiatives possible. Um, a few reminders, we ask that you please place your phones on silent. Taking uh, photos or video recording is not allowed at any point during the event, but we do encourage you to tweet uh, using the TIFF hashtag SeeTheNorth. Uh, we'd also like to welcome our online audience tuning in via the YouTube live stream. Uh, during the Q&A, we do ask that you wait for a uh, microphone to reach you before asking a question of our illuminated panelists. Um, I would like to invite you to two of our upcoming higher learning events uh, throughout our winter season. On January 29th, uh, following a shorts program of their work, emerging and established filmmakers discuss the role of film in exploring issues of spirituality, faith, tolerance, and cultural identity. On March 11th, we welcome curators from the Museum of the Moving Image, as well as the Harry Ransom Center and TIFF, to discuss the management of an exhibition of film ephemera. Uh, more details about upcoming events can be found online at tiff.net slash higher learning, where as a student and, for, and or faculty member, we encourage you to sign up for our e-newsletters. Um, two final notices today. There are really great opportunities taking place in the building that we'd like to draw your attention to, and they're both free. Uh, we'd like to thank our colleagues in the industry office for providing us an opportunity uh, to experience the new Samsung Gear VR sets as part of the Samsung VR Lounge. Um, this is a free interactive activation. The lounge is located upstairs on the third floor and is activating today from 12 p.m. noon to 3.30. We hope you have a chance to check out this exciting new technology. And secondly, uh, we'd like to remind all of you of uh, the free screening this this afternoon at 3 p.m. It's our Canadian Open Vault, where we'll be screening My American Cousin, directed by Sandy Wilson, who's a panelist on today's panel. Um, tickets to the event are free and available from our box office downstairs. So after the panel, go upstairs, check out the VR, um, cancel all your plans, and come for the 3 p.m. screening. Um, Okay, so we are thrilled to have Jason Anderson as the moderator for today's event. Jason writes about film and arts for such publications as the Toronto Star, Cinemascope, Sight and Sound, and Uncut, and teaches criticism and feature writing at the University of Toronto and Ryerson University. He's a director of programming for the Kingston Canadian Film Festival, a member of the Toronto Film Critics Association, and is a TIFF Shortcut, Shortcuts programmer. Um, please uh, join me in thanking Jason for moderating today. Great. Thanks so much, Keith. And I have the uh, great pleasure and honor of uh, introducing our panelists uh, for tonight's, uh, today's panel, which is titled First Things First, which we will get into the many ramifications of that title uh, very shortly. Uh, starting at my uh, furthest right, Sandy Wilson was born in Penticton, British Columbia. She was written and directed the features My American Cousin, which premiered at the festival and won six Genie Awards, including Best Picture, Best Director, and Best Original Screenplay, as well as its sequel, American Boyfriends. She has also directed the feature Harmony Cats and the shorts Bridal, uh, The Bridal Shower, Growing Up in Paradise, and My Life in Eight Minutes. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, next to her, Andrew Cividino. Uh, he grew up in Dundas, Ontario, and attended the film production program at Ryerson University. His short film, We Ate the Children Last, was selected as TIFF as one of Canada's top 10 shorts of 2011. Uh, Sleeping Giant, based on his 2014 Top 10 short of the same name, is his first feature, and it's screening uh, this week as part of Canada's Top 10. Welcome, Andrew. Also have Kyle McDonald. Uh, Kyle grew up on a sheep farm outside Goderich, Ontario. He discovered film at an early age and pursued it through high school and into his post-secondary career, first at Concordia University and then at Ryerson, where he graduated in 2015 with a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Film Studies and his short film, Manessa Tongue, uh, is, is here as part of the uh, top 10 for student, student shorts. Also, uh, Halima Al-Khattabi is a Montreal-based filmmaker. She graduated from l'Institut National de l'Emanche et du Son. She scripted the short La Paracade, and Nina is her directorial debut, and it's here as part of uh, Canada's top 10 shorts this year. 
and also uh, Nee Fishman, who is here as the uh, producer of many, many films that have been here uh, at TIFF in ta Canada's top 10. Uh, and he's here also uh, representing as executive producer Closet Monster, which is here at Canada's top 10. So thanks, Neve. And, uh, and yeah, was, I mean, I think it's a great subject. I mean, certainly one, you know, the coming of age story is certainly something that uh, uh, I feel uh, very, you know, it's kind of one thing that's sort of, I think, a core part of any kind of film fan's diet. And certainly um, we can all think of films that, um, that touched us or inspired us or influenced in some way, these sorts of stories. And, and maybe they're things you encounter when you're young. Maybe they're things you encounter when you're uh, much older and sort of looking back on this time of, of sort of childhood and adolescence and all these immense changes that you go through, um, all these big big things that happen. And that's certainly something that I think uh, uh, filmmakers return to again and again. I mean, one thing I was thinking about was how um, childhood and adolescence seems to take about a million times longer than the rest of your life. <laughs> once you hit, once you hit the sort of back end of things, things go a lot faster. Whereas, you know, I think childhood and adolescence seem to take uh, occupy about sort of uh, you know several millennia. Uh, so I think there's a lot to excavate. And I think that's sort of one reason that we kind of see filmmakers uh, come back to this territory again and again. And certainly you have this sort of you know kind of rich history, really from the beginnings of, of movies. I mean, certainly, um, you know, going back to all kinds of things that have, uh, that have really kind of become staples of this genre. Uh, I think about films like Stand By Me or, or The 400 Blows or, or My Life as a Dog. I mean, there's just any number of things that I think that have kind of made that kind of impact and, and, and fostered something with audiences. And certainly in Canada, I think, is a really uh, great tradition of this. And certainly it's interesting to see how many of the films that we sort of most treasure uh, kind of fit in this category, too. I mean, certainly look at something like Mon Oncle Antoine or Nobody Wave Goodbye, uh, maybe more recent examples like Crazy. Um, I also like to think that Ginger Snaps counts, even though it's a coming of age story with more hair uh, and more blood. Uh, but certainly these are, these are films that make an impact and certainly some things that we, we certainly treasure. And I guess I was just gonna, gonna start with the panelists and, and, uh, and ask them, first of all, sort of what, what kinds of coming of age films have, have made an impact on them and perhaps influenced uh, the, story, the, the stories they're, they're bringing here. Sure, Sandy, Should I you. just jump right in? Please do. Okay. Um, well, I grew up on a ranch at the end of the dirt road, and uh, we didn't have a telephone or a television, but my dad took home movies. And uh, he would bring home National Film Board films, and we'd look at the home movies, uh, which I always totally enjoyed. It was wonderful to see yourself on the screen. And um, to get on board to make a movie. I mean, I think that's something I think probably is, is a big part of the hesitation is like, well, what, what can you bring that's fresh? You know, well, how do you, I mean, was that something very much on the minds of, um, I mean, starting with Andrew, for instance, I mean, how, how do you make a, f a fresh approach to this kind of territory that has been so explored? Yeah, I mean, that's, it's difficult to do, and it's also actually just very difficult to pitch, because like Neve says, you go in, and as soon as you say coming of age, you see the eyes glaze over, and you're like, hello, hello, hello. And uh, it's, it's really hard to say, no, but this is gonna be different, because you hold a film in your, in your mind and in your heart, and you know, that it, it has unique qualities and that it deserves to be told. Uh, but finding a way to actually communicate what about that th is gonna actually make it different in a, in a way that will be meaningful um, is, is very, it's challenging because it, not only is it such a saturated genre, it's what emerging filmmakers tend toward. Um, and whether that's because uh, th it's an experience in our lives that is more like it's closely relatable in terms of you know they say write what you know there's we're more likely to have a personal experience out of that age that we've kind of had a chance to reflect on and think is worth telling but there are just so so many of them so it is it is hard to to pitch and it's also hard to find but I think when you continue to work on your story and how you want to tell it it becomes more obvious to you what's going to make it unique um, and so that was never my concern wasn't actually making it its own film with its own voice. It was actually just getting the opportunity to do so. I'm curious too, I mean, Halima, for instance, I mean, what was your, I mean, was that something, I mean, uh, was this also a time, I mean, thinking about sort of, especially thinking about that sort of point about how it is territory that young filmmakers, emerging filmmakers tend to gravitate, gravitate towards because, I mean, that stuff is still very fresh. I mean, it's sort of at the same time, you do, you, there's periods in your life where, you know, I think, and there's also um, the fact that I think some of us, or many of us, feel 14 forever. So I think that stuff stays fresh. But certainly, when you were sort of coming to sort of developing Nina, like what was I mean, was this, were you very much thinking about that time of your life? And was there something? Were there many questions that arose out of that time for yourself that you wanted to explore? 
Well, actually, in the beginning, um, the theme, the subject was about motherhood. <laughs> so it's only after when I was developing the idea and writing that um, it became a teen mother. The, the, the main character became a teen mother. So it happened secondly, uh, not initially. And um, so, but um, there are many mm, films uh, on this subject too. So it's, it, I had to find something really special, originality and very personal with the character and with the situation. So um, the, the, the film deals with a very central and specific uh, moment in the life of, on the, in the rel relationship be between this teen mother and her baby. And so I, I concentrated on this. So I don't know if it answers the question, but <laughs> it, it, it was not uh, something about my... Well, it was not about my my nostalgia about uh, teenage teenage time, but uh, more about my about the the, the motherhood um, question. And uh, actually, it's it, there's two themes that blends together. Well, I, I think you, I was just thinking about the the word nostalgia. Definitely, is something that comes up when you start talking about coming of age films and these sorts of stories where. You know, I mean, that you are sort of looking back. I mean, it, and I'm curious if any of the panelists think that's a, that's a particular danger to kind of look back on youth uh, from this sort of older perspective and and have the rose-colored glasses or just kind of, you know, perhaps see things as you'd like to remember them as opposed to how they were. Yes, just uh, f um, for me, um, there's something because I was a very I was a too serious teenager, <laughs> so I started to rebel rebel later, too late. So maybe through this movie, I try to, <laughs> I don't know, but uh, see myself more rebel uh, than, uh, I sh I, 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 it's maybe a regret that I <laughs> try to transfer in the movie. I don't think that there's something inherently right or wrong with taking that nostalgic lens, but it's definitely a choice that really affects the kind of movie you're going to make. I mean, Stand By Me is an incredibly nostalgic film, and it's still a very beautiful story, but I know that for me, when I was, I wanted to make a film that felt very anchored and present in uh, what that moment is like without any of that veneer of looking back and being like, oh, that was so lovely, and trying to get to the what feels like... An, both the, the excitement and the adrenaline and, and the wonder of it, but also the callous cruelty and all of the other things and just trying to present them, although in a narrative arc, but as as honestly as I, I could. So I think it just depends on the kind of movie you want to make, but I, I'm, I'm not a huge, like maybe sentimentality isn't as much my thing, but I love Stand By Me, so I don't know. <laughs> and I'm curious about Sandy's take too, because I mean, certainly, I mean, My American Cousin emerges at a time you know, when the 50s were very romanticized, and it was very that kind of, the, the, the view of sort of the happy days view of the 50s was still very prevalent. I mean, and the movie works sort of against and with that in very delightful ways, I've always thought. So, I mean, we, sorry. I'm, I'm not sure what the question the is. The question is basically, how are you thinking about sort of presentations of, of the 50s and sort of thinking about like, you know, uh, for my American okay. Cousin, was, it, was nostalgia a factor for you or, or something you avoided? Well, I've never understood exactly what the difference between nostalgia and sentimentality is, but um, I really was kind of um, tickled pink to be able to completely embellish, uh, you know, the reality of the situation. You know, I mean, it was true. My American cousin did show up. In reality, he never even let me in his car. But <laughs> I was able to take a whole bunch of other experiences that had happened over the years and cram it all into one weekend. So it was sort of like an opportunity to uh, embellish the childhood memories. Well, I guess that's a big part of the process, too. Maybe uh, Kyle would like to speak to that. It's kind of like how, you know, it's, 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 it's an interesting area, too, where it's kind of there is this autobiographical content that certainly is feeding these kind of, you know, these sort of portraits of childhood or youth. Um, but they are fictionalized. I mean, they are transplanted in other characters, people who are not like yourself, perhaps. I mean, was that sort of part of the process for you? Yeah, so I I wrote the characters sort of around, like, a vague, uh, like, assembly of other people and things around me growing up. Nothing, like, directly happened, but I'd, I'd hear about things that happened. I know when I was pitching um, the film to people in Toronto, I'd say it's about these kids who steal their pickup truck, and people in Toronto would be like, like, what? And when I went back home and I was like finding locations and things and I'd say what it's about, they're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> so it was just like, it was, it was to be a typical sort of reflection of uh, 
that environment and that lo like location in rural Canada rather than like a direct copy of my own life. And I'm curious from 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 Neve's take about the process of sort of watching Stephen develop Closet Monster, which I think probably of all the films here, the most sort of ex extreme, you know, kind of it's it's the most sort of surreal. It's sort of in terms of its sort of take on a lot of these sorts of kind of core adolescent anxieties. I mean, was that sort of I mean, in, in in that process was it sort of hard to kind of figure out like how how much to push it or or to push it even further? I mean, what was it kind of like trying to determine you know how much uh, how much stylization was was was, was required? Well, there's no need to push it further. It was pushed pretty far right from the start. Uh, you know, I, it, it was interesting because I first met Stephen uh, a few years back before he went to the film center. Right after uh, he graduated from um, from Ryerson. The films that I liked uh, were like um, the Last Picture Show, American Graffiti, Mon Oncle Antoine. Uh, and I think that those childhood years are the years which stain us most deeply. So it is rich territory. Yeah, for me, I think, uh, I mean, I did a lot of research while working on my, my script in, in the genre and watching a lot. And the films that really stuck with me, I think, in more recent years were films like Andrea Arnold's Fish Tank. Um, uh, Tomboy was an incredible film recently. And then also there are ones that you go to for different reasons. So for me, in terms of uh, setting and tone, uh, Picnic at Hanging Rock is is kind of, you know, it's a more obscure Australian film, but it's got this incredible sense of uh, foreboding in the setting that really mirrors the, the, this, the darkness of this coming of age tale. So I think you go to different places for different pieces of inspiration throughout, and there's definitely no shortage in this genre. Uh, yeah, growing up, I feel like I tended towards fantasy, even as a like a coming of age story. So even if you look at the original Star Wars, and I also was growing up at the pinnacle of like Harry Potter, which progressed growing up through many films. And then yeah, in researching my film, I looked at very typical coming of age stories like st used to mention Stand by Me, uh, Mud, Kings of Summer, like a lot of recent stuff as well as older stuff. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Well, uh, I was also influenced by um, Andrea Arnold's films, like Fish Tank and uh, Céline Sciamma, and some uh, older uh, films uh, from um, Maurice Piala in France. Mm. And also, uh, you know, the um, Darden Brothers film, um, and um, very contemporary movies uh, dealing with uh, teenage uh, coming-of-age stories. So, and Mainly French French films, actually. <laughs> I have my own, I think. Hello? Hello? You're good. Yeah, OK. Uh, well, actually, when I first started making films, one of the first films uh, that I worked on was a short film that was uh, about my partner's grandfather in BC. And I became aware of uh, Sandy's work. And, and, and your use of, of, of home movies, um, I think, influenced uh, probably the way that I've been thinking about making movies forever, and a lot of our movies in the past <laughs> 40 years uh, have had the use of home movies. We've sometimes made fake home movies because we're just so enamored with that form. And then, of course, uh, your film, uh, My American Cousin, was such a seminal film that uh, made me realize that uh, you know we can make great movies in this country. And, and uh, so thank you for that. Uh, I, I guess. Earlier than that, uh, you know, I'm a Chord is one of my favorite films. It was really, really amazing. And uh, and I was just doing some research uh, <laughs> before. It, uh, one of my truly favorite films I thought was just so beautiful and I wished would never end was uh, uh, was uh, uh, L'Argent de Poche, a small change, I think it was called, a Truffaut film, that I thought when I was thinking about it just in the green room before, I thought, well, where did I see that? And I thought... Uh, I remember seeing it at the Cinesphere, uh, and it was the first year of TIFF, so that's how old I am. Uh, 1976, uh, it was a gala <laughs> in the first year, uh, and uh, um, it was kind of interesting to connect it to this and to TIFF and to all of these things that have happened since then. Well, it's amazing, because certainly, I mean, you know, as, as a programmer and a critic, of, it, it, it's something that always seems to be kind of part of, of, of the sort of movie menu, these sorts of films, and, and you know, um, uh, you know, good and less good. Of course, all the ones here are great. But it's sort of, I, I guess one thing I was curious about from News' perspective is, is this a kind of film that the industry 
uh, wants more of? Or is it something that kind of, it's, what's, what's the sort of uh, perception of the sort of coming of age film from that sort of perspective? Well, I think, I think um, you know, we love those kind of films and I think any person in the audience would, would point to a coming of age film as, you know, or several of them as their favorite films ever. Uh, I think from the perspective of trying to make them or being a producer of, you know, I think the, wor the, the moment you pitch someone, you, you can't even say the words coming of age together because once you do, like you just, you know, your, your, your funder or your distributor just falls to the ground, like uh, just impossible, really. You know, I think these guys have made their films just on their own. <laughs> like, uh, I'm sure, Andrew, you probably had a similar experience and then you had to make your film and then after, you know, people supported it. But I think that, that uh, uh, it, it, you know, it's, 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 a kind of, it, it's a kind of genre that, that uh, uh, just does not have uh, 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 sort of a, a, an initial backing from people. Um, I mean, I can say, uh, you know, tell you a funny story about when we first uh, pitched Closet Monster uh, to our esteemed distributor. I don't know if anyone is here from <laughs> Elevation. Good. I'm sure they're watching in the office right now. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, we, we kind of had to, you know, we said, well, you know, it's a film. It's from a really brilliant, you know, filmmaker who's done a lot of shorts of Stephen Dunn, you know, and he's going to be really, it's, you know, he's really going to be acclaimed at one point, but he's a first-time filmmaker, and they kind of slump a bit. And you say, well, you know, it's a it's a coming of age story, it's just, you know, like just like, you know, and then and then you say, well, you know, it's set in St. John's, Newfoundland, and it's you know, gay, and it's like, ah. you know, so um, and they said, absolutely not, you know, no way, and we said, yes, you have to do it, and and you know, they ended up doing it, and then I have to say, you know, uh, if they are watching, uh, is that the moment they saw the film, which is exactly my point here, is that you know, a very rough cut of the film the room just lit up and they said, wow, this is so amazing and thank you so much for, for bringing this film to us. And so it just, it takes, uh, it takes a little bit of perseverance at first, but uh, you know, I think that uh, these films have proven themselves to be kind of staple of cinema and, uh, and you know, just the fact that all of us have had such you know, uh, different viewpoints of what, what the films are, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, you know, speaks for, for, for the genre. I'm curious. I mean, this is, you know, going back to when um, uh, Sandy was making My American Cousin. Did you, did you feel some of this sort of same resistance and sort of going on? This is obviously a very different time for, for the Canadian film business back then, too. Yes. <laughs> yeah, there were, uh, it was probably about two years of hearing no. No, it, this has not been done before. And uh, no, you're not going to be, uh, you know, the first to tell the girl's story. And um, you know you've never directed a feature, and you've only done one dramatic short. But on the other end of it, having made it, when we screened it in Moscow, some big old Russian guy would come up and say, "In Russia, it is the same with the mothers and their daughters." And screening it in Sydney, Australia, a beautiful. Indian actress came up and she said, oh, I had a boyfriend just like that. And I said, and did he have a big fancy car? And she said, no, but he had a really nice bicycle. <laughs> so I think that the coming of age stories translate. You know, they, they travel well. It just, yeah, I guess part of the thing is they just have to kind of you know, like like in like a news story, they have to exist. You have to show them because I think that I mean I'm certainly and I think there's probably um, you know, all kinds of people you're sort of pitching. Well, but she had the something very mature inside her, so it was her, and her name is uh, Elisabeth Tremblay-Gagnon, and she's, uh, she's, uh, she's fantastic, yeah. <laughs> and, well, that's, I mean, actually, it's funny, because uh, many of you brought this up, and it's certainly um, something that I think that all these films share, is this incredible sense of place. I mean, place and often period, in terms of sort of time and when things are happening. Um, and it's amazing to think that maybe that is something, I think, that kind of um, a great coming-of-age film, is there's a big component there of certainly kind of evoking uh, an environment. It's not just about the people, it's just how they are kind of indivisible from this place where they are. And it's certainly something that I think is kind of, um, becomes very important. We, um, and so I mean, that, and that's something, I mean, well, I mean, for, for instance, for, for Neve and uh, looking at sort of the development of Closet Monster, was, this, was, it, was it sort of a fundamentally St. John's thing I mean, at, at every point? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think you, you can say that for most or almost uh, coming of age is coming of age in a place 
uh, because coming of age uh, is an inner expression of usually, uh, you know, a younger filmmaker, an emerging filmmaker, as someone said, I think Andrew, you know, it comes from some from within. It's a story that you know. Um, so yes, definitely in, 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 in the case of Closet Monster, it had to be from uh, St. John's. It had to be the story of this boy growing up in that particular community. Uh, and I think that's, um, that's the beauty of it. But actually, all of these are exactly that, you know, where, you know, Penticton, you know, I mean, who would, who would set a film in Penticton? Although it's one of the most beautiful places on earth, uh, I think. And, and because of that film, I've gone back there numerous times and I only drink Okanagan wine. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, and that's actually true. Uh, so, you know, it's a, it, it, it does come from, uh, I think a place is, 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 is absolutely crucial to, to the, um, I think in the minds of the filmmakers that create them, the place is just so strong that you can't sort of extricate it from, you know, in the films that I mentioned before, like I'm a Cord or, uh, or Quatre Sans Coups, or uh, any of, you know, they come from a place too, you know, and that's the beauty of them, and that's the splendor of watching them as you're watching the emergence of, of, uh, uh, of a person in front of you, the co so-called coming of age, but also you're watching it within the context of a place that is exotic and amazing, you know? It seems like it has to be tied to a place because that's one thing you have no freedom over when you're in that age. You're stuck wherever it is you are. You don't have any agency to say, well, I'm going to pick up and move wherever. Like, whether it's a small town or a big city or whatever, I think coming of age has to be inherently tied to a place because that is inherent to the experience. And um, I really wanted to set mine at the ranch where I grew up. I insisted on shooting it in the house where I'd grown up. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a big fight all the way along the line. And I did want to shoot it in the Okanagan because I think it's one of the most beautiful parts of the country. And it's kind of interesting that a month ago when I was in Los Angeles picking up the DCP, we screened it. And um, the guy behind the console, a kid about 18 years old, said, oh, Sandy, I like your film. Was the scenery real? <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing just to think that that's, yeah, people, you know, it, it, it does, actually, it's funny, I actually had the same moment I was watching recently, I'm like, wow, that's really good green screen. It's like, oh no, <laughs> that's just a mountain and a lake, that's for reals. Uh, but certainly, that, and it's something that I think that kind of is, is, I mean, having that kind of specificity is something, I think, that's something that we, we, we treasure out these coming of age films as well. I mean, especially the great ones, they just feel like they really are rooted somewhere, they're rooted in experience, they're rooted in, in, in specific environments, and that's something that we you don't necessarily get from all kinds of other films. I mean, they really have to be like that. And one thing, too, I was really kind of curious about, too, especially, you know, um, in, in, in sort of dealing as with young actors, I mean, because one thing that also connects many of these films is, is sex, and the sort of first rumblings, maybe not rumblings, maybe more like earthquakes or whatever, it's, but this, this, this something that definitely is a sort of very, you know, becomes a very sort of charged part of many of these stories. Um, and I'm curious about how, um, first of all, how that sort of became, you know, that, how that as, a, as a theme, the sort, of, the sort of sexual awakening or sort of suspicion that something else is, the life is maybe about this something else. Uh, kind of plays in each of these films, uh, and also how you deal with young actors when sort of dealing with sort of perhaps sort of more potentially sort of troublesome area when you actually are kind of dealing with very young actors who um, maybe don't have the perspective that you do as as an artist. Uh -oh. no one's yeah, jumping. no one's jumping for that one. On one. Yeah, go, Andrew. Andrew, you picked up the mic. Um, yeah, I, I think. It's certainly such a like a, a a critical personal development that happens uh, with people, and it's it's as a storyteller, it's also like a very rich thing to get into with character because it is so complex, uh, and and can be often confusing and and many different things and uh, all these other things like with these intense feelings, you end up with jealousy, betrayal, and all the hallmarks of you know a, of a great narrative too. Uh, so I think it's n not surprising that people focus in on that. I think it is hard to, you know, I, I am envious of some filmmakers who can deal quite explicitly with, with sex in, in this genre because I definitely had felt I almost had to skirt around it because I don't know that I was, like, comfortable enough to be working in that space. Uh, but I think when you're working with... with um, your actors when it comes to these sorts of things, I, I don't know, sometimes... I think there are different ways to approach it. I think um, for me, it, it's it's conversations that like are context specific with each actor about a certain scene, and sometimes it's about 
I'm like a scene's going to be lensed in a particular way, and we're not going to have the conversation because if these act if these young actors all know exactly what's happening in this scene, none of them are going to be able to be present in it because these characters aren't supposed to to be a- aware of all these things. So to for it to play naturally and for the everyone to not like freak out about like the subtext of a scene, uh, then like I think as a director, there are times where you choose to like shape and withhold what different characters know about a particular scene. And, and Sandy, with the same thing, when you're dealing with all these sort of like, you know, um, 50s, hot-blooded 50s adolescents, it was sort of a, a, you have a sort of similar sort of subtext in mind that maybe you weren't necessarily letting the cast know about? Uh, it was a little bit tricky because um, I think back then in 1959, there were rules. Everybody knew the rules. You were either a good girl or a bad girl. Everything above the waist was okay. That was it. And... Um, to explain uh, necking, uh, you know, and uh, that kind of stuff. I remember explaining that to the actors, and then finally one of the actors said, oh, you mean foreplay? And I went, oh, okay, fine, yeah, foreplay. Uh, and I remember that we had to do a little bit of um, uh, rehearsals for what we called the necking scene in the Cadillac when Butch is with Shirley. Uh, and at first the two actors were very uncomfortable, and um, gradually they warmed up to each other and I would say cut and cut again. <laughs> <laughs> and, and for Kyle too, I, mean, I guess maybe not so much like the sexual component, but certainly very emotionally charged. I mean, what, I mean, what is the process of being, I mean, did you have to be, I think, quite protective with young actors when sort of dealing with that kind of material? Yeah, there, yeah there's no sexual tension really at all, but especially in the scene in the blanket fort where you hear the parents, we had to like, sort of explain it. They were all from like... Or was about to. Uh, and he had this vague idea of this film. And and, uh, and at that point, I, I, I felt that, you know, well, first, mostly because I myself am one of those people that then is hearing a pitch about coming of age and thinking, oh, no, not a coming of age film. Uh, and, uh, and at that point, I'd been working on a... Uh, just finished a film, I think, or about to finish a film called The Boy Who Smells Like Fish, which is also a coming of age film. So I thought, ah... Enough of that, but uh, but of course Stephen has a very unique kind of uh, aura and presence, and you know a lot of times for me as a as someone who's uh, taking uh, pitches and and especially in the past few years when I've been working a lot with uh, with younger filmmakers, uh, I, I really responded to him as a person, you know, and and uh, so I said, uh, well, great, you know, this sounds interesting, and and uh, you know the pitch was very very emotional as Stephen tends to be sometimes, uh, which is great, uh, and uh, and and uh, and basically sent him to school <laughs> for two years uh, and said, you know, you go to the film center and see what happens, and uh, and after you know a year and him kind of pursuing this. Uh, uh, you know, it 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 seemed like he was you know he was really uh, you know gonna not let go of this particular uh, film, and it was so inside him, and it was so much his you know his own story, but mixed with you know kind of uh, all kinds of um, uh, you know horror elements and fantasy, and and uh, it was really really interesting. And at that point, I thought um, my two young uh, younger colleagues who were working with me, who were kind of uh, you know coming through the ranks would be a really perfect film for them to to actually be first producers on too and and so it kind of all came together with that so Kevin Crixt and Fraser Ash who's here uh you know kind of took it over and and uh and it became you know it became kind of an, an all-around first-time effort and then you know it was which is what was so amazing when it, it's done uh, uh, as well as it has. I'm so proud, like a dad, you know, like <laughs> they're all my kids and it's all worked out <laughs> and it's fine. So, yeah, so that's how, how the, the, you know, how, how um, s- that journey evolved. It's funny because just thinking about that sort of atmosphere where you're actually, I mean, certainly, you know, when you're making a movie about young people, you are working with young people, which can, it certainly is, uh, uh, you know, brings a certain kind of energy that you're going to get from, you know, that, that you may not get from other experiences. I mean, I, so, I mean, one thing I was really curious about is just, is, is, is kind of like um, really sort of trying to, you know, I mean, we'll, we'll talk also about the stories, but I mean, finding the, the, the people, like finding the people you needed, especially the actors. I mean, and when they are often unprofessional uh, or non-professional, not that they're unprofessional, but when they're non-professional first timers, I mean, what, what was the process for each of you sort of trying to find these people you, you, you needed uh, in front of the camera? Some of them are unprofessional. <laughs> 
um, I mean, for for us, for casting Sleeping Giant, it was um, it was a very very protracted process because um, I think we knew instinctively that the kind of kids that we wanted for that film, uh, there was no way that there's no 13 or 14 year old in the world who has the craft that we could pull them out of of Toronto and bring them up and ask them to be these characters. So it became really clear quickly that what we actually needed to do is go and find kids who were as close to the characters that were written as possible. And to do that, we went up and spent weeks. We went to every single high school and drama club and to the mall handing out flyers like weirdos and the entire thing and saw uh, you know, literally hundreds of kids by the end of it. Uh, to f and we ended up, it was a Kijiji ad that one of our actors responded to uh, and just showed up without a script or a time and was like, oh, here there's a movie. And we inter we interviewed our kids first and s and right away, you know, he came out for the wrong role, but we knew right away, this is our Nate, like this is our guy. And you just, I think, have to build it out that way. And for us, it was a lot of workshopping and seeing who could work together. But then you have a lot of people who have never been on a set. And I think especially for a feature, it's a marathon. It really is to, to make a feature. And so having the, the stamina and, and keeping motivation up and and understanding that there are a lot of people who are here giving everything that they've got and that's what's expected of you every single day. So it was it was a, like a steep learning curve but a really wonderful experience working with actors who ha like hadn't really acted before but were willing to bring so much of themselves to the characters. And, and Sandy too? When I got the idea from my American cousin, Margaret Langrick immediately came to mind. Uh, she was a girl who lived across the street from me and um, you know we were family friends, and um, so I wrote the script with Margaret Langrick in mind and would watch her for her bits, and she'd be watching me for my bits, uh, but of course the funding agencies and poor Peter O'Brien and almost everybody else in, position of in positions of authority did not want to cast the girl from across the street. Uh, they thought that was, you know, taking a chance on me, taking a chance. But um, I completely and totally insisted on it because to me it wouldn't have been, it, it, it wouldn't have been the film without her because uh, she had the right blend of obnoxious and precocious uh, that I was kind of looking for. And then John Wildman, I'm not sure if he's here or not, but anyway, I met John Wildman at an audition here in Toronto, and when I first saw him, I thought he's way too gorgeous, he's too beautiful. No, not what I had in mind at all. Uh, but when I saw him next to a very young, kind of um, gorky girl, he was there was something quite sweet about him, and so it was in that call back at the audition that I thought, oh my goodness, he's got a really lovely something about him, I'm g and so I went back and rewrote the part of Butch. Uh, and most of the other characters, I think we picked up in Penticton a little bit the same, but um, you know, as you, where you audition a whole bunch of kids. What we did was set up a camera and ask the high school kids to come down and we played some rock and roll music and got them to move, uh, you know, to see who could dance, who was comfortable in front of the camera, and who looked good on the camera. So that's kind of how we did our casting. Um, it was really important to me when we were like casting to cast locally as opposed to casting in Toronto. So all the actors, are like they've never done screen acting at all. They're, um, some, well, one of them hadn't even really done theater acting. Um, so I think that was the biggest hurdle. They're all like fantastic kids, like and amazing to work with. But I think just like working with the tools and like trying to form a vocabulary with them was the hardest part. Thank you. So <coughs> for Nina, we did um, an open call uh, cast, and uh, also it was important for, for me to find the, the Nina, the main character, in the neighborhood where the story takes place, because it's uh, like um, a working class, working class neighborhood in Montreal. So for me, it was important that the, 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 the actress comes from uh, there, but um, we found uh, the secondary roles and the extra there, but not the main role. So I finally found her on the agency uh, site. I was looking for pictures, and and when I saw her pictures, um, it was really obvious for me that uh, she had this space. What I was looking for: the authenticity, the the, the natural, the, 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 the I, I needed her to be strong and, and fragile at, at the same time, and finally it was 
her, and she, she comes from uh, Quebec City, so not at all from Montreal.